Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. And it is another Jobs Day Friday. We are awaiting the numbers from the Labor Department. We will bring them to you in just about 90 seconds. Let's dig into those expectations ahead of this print here, Brad. Consensus forecasting 200,000 jobs to be added to the U.S. economy in the past month. That would be well below what we saw in January. Remember that January surprise print, 353,000 Wage growth is also going to once again be a focal point here. You can see it up there on your screen. The year-over-year -year growth that we are expecting is 4.3%. That will be a tick lower than the prior reading, a 4.5% rise. But when we talk about the Fed, we talk about obviously they are closely watching the jobs report and what that tells us. But really, wages is going to be very indicative of the fight to tame inflation and what that then means ultimately for Fed policy down the road. Yeah, that's spot on. Everybody was watching Fed Chair Jay Powell this week, of course, testifying on Capitol Hill. But there was also one other speech that may have caught the eye of investors on the front of wages here. And it was what Governor Michelle Bowman actually had to say, particularly about the recent labor market data suggesting ongoing elevated wage growth as some businesses continue to report above average ways increases to compensate for elevated prices and high inflation. So employees clearly going back to their employers saying, hey, look, I need to offset what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing on a cyclical and weekly cost basis. And if you can help me do that on the wage front, then maybe I'll be a much more happy employee at the end of the day. And so we'll see exactly where those wages continue to moderate higher here. But that has been one of the stickier elements of this report month over month as well. Yeah, it certainly has. And also labor force participation rate, that is going to be something that we're focusing on here coming in at 62.5 percent prior month expectation years for a slight rise of just about 62.6 percent so again the focal point here on this headline number exactly what we are going to get with that prior print coming in 353,000 the expectations for 200,000 and we are getting this right now 275,000 jobs added to the U.S. economy last month in the month of February, much hotter than what the street was anticipating. Taking a look at that unemployment rate, actually ticking higher, up to 3.9% average hourly earnings on a month-over-month -month basis, coming in just below what the street had been forecasting, a rise of about ten a tenth of a percent. The year-over-year -year change in average hourly earnings coming in in line with the street's expectation, 4.3%. So uh, ticking uh, two-tenths of a percent lower here than what we saw that prior Reading. But once again, Brad, another month here with this job spring coming in at much higher elevated levels than what the street had been forecasting. Yeah, the job gains really occurring here in healthcare, government, food services, and drinking places, and social assistance and transportation and warehousing there, particularly as you look through some of the sectors. We're going to have much more of that sector breakdown. That labor force participation number as well that we were keeping close tabs on, the participation rate 62.5% for the third consecutive month, and then the employment to population ratio, a little changed at about 60.1%. 1% here. But I continue to think about the people not in the labor force who currently want a job, 5.7 million. That was little changed here. And that also came up in some of the speeches that we heard from Fed members over the course of this week. That is a critical area that they're going to continue to keep a close eye on, especially as they continue to monitor the incoming data indicating where inflation is moving sustainably towards that 2% goal, how much that ties back into the employment situation, and particularly where people are sensing in this market right now, the tightness of the labor market, that's where the Fed has been really keying in on this tightness of the labor market and looking specifically at that labor force participation rate as such. Yeah, and it's also important to point out here the revision. So last yeah. month, we initially got the 353,000 headline number. That has been revised lower to 229,000. So that is worth pointing out. The average hourly earnings on a month-over-month -month basis was revised slightly lower to an increase of a half of a percent. And then that year-over-year -year change revised lower by a tenth of a percent to 4.4 percent. So it's certainly important to point out those revisions as we think about and try to best guess the strength of the labor market here, what exactly that means for Fed policy going forward. And then, of course, the wage fight, the fact that wages are still increasing by the amount that they are, clearly just points to the fact that the Fed has a little bit more ways to go in its fight to tame inflation. Absolutely. Well, Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is standing by at the Wi-Fi Interactive for a check of the markets to see how futures are reacting here. Jared, I'll toss things over to you. 
Small caps are liking this. It looks like uh, tech, the tech-heavy NASDAQ is liking this too. Let me show you the Russell 2000 first. Here's the small caps. We were just underwater before the report and then we sprung to action above, uh, now up about eight-tenths of 1%. And you'll notice the Dow still negative. So it's not like everything going up at once or at the same levels. Dow futures were a little bit more depressed uh, from yesterday's closing levels. And here's the NASDAQ. NASDAQ futures showing once again in the green here, but really just up up against those earlier highs from earlier in the evening right around the European Open. Uh, let me get a sense of the interest rate market right here. We have uh, futures. Here are the two-year Treasury note futures, and you can see a little bit of a spike there. Uh, that means that yields are going down. They're ticking lower. Here is the 10-year. You can see that spiked up a little bit too, but not a big reaction. I think in the bond market, what people are going to be looking for is what the Fed is thinking about all of this. And you're going to see that reflected in Fed funds futures, and all of that's going to be hashed out over the next few hours. But in the meantime, I'm thinking this report has something for the bulls and the bears. The headline payrolls number, a little bit heavy, yes, but you had some uh, a little bit under Wall Street expectations when it came to that monthly wage increase number, the year on year, as you said, it, as you said, Shauna, those are in line with expectations, but the monthly a little bit light. And then the labor force participation rate that came in a little bit lower. So you have a small, fewer people in the workforce and you have a higher unemployment rate structurally. What does that mean? Hard to say, but nevertheless, we see gold futures heading higher. We've seen gold hitting record highs over the last six days. Looks like we're going to make it lucky number seven here. All right, Jared, 777, let's go is what Silk Sonic would say. We'll see. For more on this jobs data, we're joined by Steve Sosnick, Interactive Brokers Chief Strategist here with us in studio, and Paul Donovan, UBS Global Wealth Management Chief Economist. Great to have you both here with us this morning. Steve, you're sitting just to my right here, so I want to go to you first, and that's no shade to you at all, Paul. <laughs> but when we think about what we were expecting coming into this, you were looking for the consensus of about 200,000 here. We got above that. With the revisions, we actually got a revision combined of 167,000 lower than previously reported for the past two months here. Just make sense of this for us here. Well, I, I think Jared said it well. I think there was something in there, you know, for the bulls and the bears. And considering considering this market psychology right now, you know, the bulls are the bulls are in control here. Um, you know, yes, the headline number was a bit shockingly high, but those the two month revisions is actually quite astoundingly big. I mean, we, we've we've sucked out 167,000 before we beat by the 75,000. So call it call it net 100,000 down. The month over month. Um, wage increase uh, was was 0.1 instead of 0.2. I haven't seen it out to you know how many significant digits it is. So so we were, we're about that 4.3 anyway. Um, and you know there, there's nothing here to upset the bulls um, narrative here, um, even despite some despite some sort of naggingly you know bad pieces of bad data in there. Paul, what, what's your sense of the report that we're getting? Because, yes, that headline number did come in hot, but like Steve was just pointing to, you had unemployment ticking up, the downward revisions in the prior two months. Is this actually maybe a softer print than it initially looks at at first take? Well, I mean, this is an ongoing problem that we've got with non-farm payrolls. The data is really, really bad quality these days. Fewer than half the companies that are asked actually bother to send back their payrolls number to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So you know, effectively, you're surveying a minority of, of companies that are being asked. Um, so we get these big revisions, and I think the revised numbers are more consistent with the narrative that we're hearing elsewhere, which is, yes, things are calming down a bit. Churn in the labor market, people job hopping, that's been declining. That's also part of this picture. So no, overall, I think this is, it's not a disastrous report but by any means, but it's a softer report and it's consistent with the sort of soft economic landing scenario that some of us have been calling for for some time. When we think, Paul, as well, about some of the sectors that, that saw the most gains here, I mean, we're talking about health care, government, food service, drinking places, social assistance. Uh, it's, some of those would, would kind of lend to the job hopping nature in those industries specifically. But then where else would you look for more, more stickiness to start to prevail within the employment situation? Well, we're, we're already seeing this. Um, I mean, the JOLTS data, which is an even less reliable survey than non-farm payrolls, it has to be said. But you know, that has that, that saw a huge increase in vacancy numbers 
uh, a couple of years ago, not because there were necessarily more vacancies, that's not what actually is reported, but because people were changing companies a lot more. And now we're seeing actually people staying in place for longer. Yeah, the reason is, of course, a lot of people sat at home during COVID, they had some kind of midlife crisis, decided, no, I want to go out and do something completely different. But the thing is, if you're going to have a midlife crisis, you're over it by now, or at least you should be. And so people are now getting down to, to the, you know, the day-to-day jobs that they've always been doing. So we're getting that static uh, uh, process coming through. We're seeing that, too, in things like the Beige Book. Um, you know, anecdotal evidence can perhaps be a bit more useful than these unreliable surveys at the moment. And that also is indicating that actually you know, people are just getting on with life now, staying put, and we're not getting this churn in the labor market. Steve, what, what do you think of the reaction that we're seeing in futures here this morning? We saw that spike higher on this softer, if you want to characterize it like that, softer than expected to print in a number of areas. What does that then tell us just about the action that we could see as we look at the NASDAQ futures, at least, and the S&P futures to trading to the upside? Well, I mean, first, you know, we've, we've gotten a lot of what I would call mysterious Friday ramps, and that's because... Um, you have weekly options expiring on Friday. So these Euro DTE people who trade in spiders, SPX index, et cetera, get to do it every day of the week. The people who trade individual options only have their zero date on Fridays. And so we've seen a lot of like ramping up. And so there's nothing in here that prevents that. Um, and I, I know that's sort of like a, a crazy answer saying we're going to rally just because we've been rallying, but we're in that sort of momentum driven nutty market. So unless the narrative really changes, unless the bond market really changes its view, um, it, it, there's nothing here that if you're inclined to just buy, continue buying the rally, there's no reason to tell you mm-hmm. not to do that. Um, you know, whether we, at least in the short term, we'll, we'll worry about the longer term later. And so I guess furthering that, though, does this trigger any type of material change? in people's portfolio strategy. You see like a, a print like this come out, revisions with this print also come out, and now a Fed that's trying to figure out where in this tight labor market they're continuing to implement strategy or just say, you know what, we're comfortable just waiting for more data because they can, they can lean on that seemingly all they want at this juncture. You know, I think this, if you're going to say marginally, it'll marginally move the needle toward the idea of maybe a June cut. The, the Fed funds futures haven't really ticked that. It's about 98% when I checked a second ago, um, you know, up from about 94. So that doesn't move the needle. But the other thing is we, we've managed to go from anticipating six to seven rate cuts to somewhere between three to four rate cuts for the year. And it hasn't dampened the market's enthusiasm at all. And I'd argue, well, you know, we, investors have pivoted from the idea of needing rate cuts to the idea of okay, we've got a decent enough economy. There's nothing in here to me, and I certainly want to hear from Paul, um, whether this upsets that that idea that the economy's good enough, and now actually if there's a little less labor pressure, maybe the Fed, maybe the Fed can come a little more accommodative. Paul, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the real risk that we run with the Federal Reserve is that if they do nothing on rates, real interest rates are going to be rising. Inflation is coming down. Um, you know, I, I often say the, the U.S. doesn't have an inflation problem. It's got a Florida problem and a Texas problem. Most of the U.S. has already got inflation you know, at or very close to 2%. As inflation comes down, real rates are going up. And that, of course, is a, as a constraint on the economy. So what the Fed's got to ask itself against the backdrop of this sort of labor report is do you want to be pushing down aggressively on the economy from this point onwards? And the answer to that has got to be no. You, know, you want maybe a neutral policy. You don't want to be boosting the economy. But holding real rates stable means that you've got to cut the nominal rate as inflation continues to decline over the next three quarters. All right. Paul Donovan, always great to get your insight. And Steve Zazdick, thanks so much for joining us here on set with us. We appreciate you guys both breaking down this jobs print. Let's do a quick recap of the numbers here. Again, that headline number coming in hotter than anticipated. 275,000 jobs were added for the month of February. But when you look underneath the surface of some of those other key numbers here, Pointing to some softness in this report, unemployment rate ticking higher to 3.9%. Also, that month-over-month change in wage growth coming in slightly below what the street was looking for here, a tenth of a percent showing up maybe a bit more progress 
on the fight to tame inflation here in the longer run. And then revisions, that is really critical within this report. The prior two months revised lower here. So factoring in those downward revisions for the prior two months, really pointing, really painting a softer picture here, a softer uh, labor market picture than what we had initially seen here over the last two months. So again, that headline number, 275,000 unemployment rate, 3.9% average hourly earnings on a year-over-year basis in line of 4.3%. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back. The February jobs were coming out at 275,000 jobs were added to the U.S. economy. Unemployment ticking higher to 3.9 percent. Average hourly earnings up on a year-over-year basis to 4.3 percent. We also got some revisions to the prior two months. December gain was revised down to 290,000 from 333,000. And also going a step further here, slower from a downwardly revised gain of 229,000 in January here. So revisions for the prior two months also factoring in to the move that we're seeing in the futures market today. Well, let's break it down by sector. We've got Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kimlani, Danny Romero, and Brooke De, Brooke De Palma for a roundup of the sectors. Anjali, let's start with you. Of course, healthcare, we've seen a little bit of gains, of course, but softer than last month. To your point, Shauna, earlier, you're talking about softness that you see in the industry, and we're seeing that this uh, in here as well. 67,000 jobs added above the average for the last 12 months, which was 58,000, but still an increase. Last month was 70,000, and we've seen 
seen some shifts in sort of where those jobs are coming in. For example, ambulatory significant boost last month, now just at 28,000. Meanwhile, hospitals increased from last month, 28,000 jobs added there. And this is all part of what we see as physician shortage and uh, hospital shortage problems. You've seen it. If you've ever been to a hospital in the last few months, you know that this has been happening. And so these numbers are matching what you've seen, which is high churn and the need for more professionals as the industry struggles to fill these roles. Meanwhile, we also saw a little bit of a dip in nursing homes, but we did see a jump last month, so that could be the balancing out there. But what's interesting about these numbers is they tell the story of how much churn and how much uncertainty is going on in the health industry. Telehealth, for example, if you've seen in the last several years, we know during the pandemic, huge spikes in those numbers, and that has also softened, telling another story about what the shifts are in where people are getting services and where the demand is for those services as well. You can see on the screen that decrease in the last couple of years. Uh, we also know that, for example, players like Amazon and CVS hiring in an ambulatory or outpatient sort of setting with pr primary care and, and, the, and the like. So really, it's going to be interesting to see how this trend follows through the year as these shifts in demand of services happens. Meanwhile, I know we've got Danny Romero standing by with construction. Danny, what have you got? There were no surprises in the construction sector. Jobs added in this area gained about 23,000 in February, in line with some analyst expect expectations that we're expecting between 20,000 and 24,000 jobs added. Remember, construction is divided into two buckets. We have non-residential and residential. And if we take a look at the non-residential job numbers last month, that really grew by 4,300. Under that umbrella, we have the heavy and civil engineering construction jobs. And those, remember, those jobs add, build our highways, our roads, our streets, our dams, our water supply. And so that grew by 12,500. And the reason behind that, the strength there, really is an increase in government spending and the Infrastructure Act that will still continue to be really a strong area as more money will be allocated to those types of jobs. Now, shifting over to residential, residential building construction jobs, that lost a little bit of steam, only added 200 jobs there. Some economists are really expecting that that will uh, increase throughout the year due to the fact that there has been an increase in single family housing projects that are in the works. And one last point really is over the last year, wages for construction has actually actually increased by $2 an hour. So that really is an opportunity in this continues to really be an opportunity in the labor market. But let's go to hospitality and leisure with Brooke De Palma. Brooke. Good morning, Danny. That's right. Uh, leisure and hospitality saw the second largest gain last quarter out of all the sectors that this reports breaks down. Now, leisure and hospitality did add 58,000 jobs, reaching a grand total of 16.8 overall, 16.8 uh, million overall jobs there. Restaurant and bar is adding the most last month, coming in at adding 41,600 jobs, reaching a grand total within that sector of uh, uh, roughly 12.3 million jobs. Now, accommodation, think uh, hospitality, think hotels. They added nearly 3,000 jobs last month, approximately reaching 1.9 million jobs. And across the board, we saw leisure and hospitality really do well. Of course, this experiential economy has been booming, especially as we make way into 2024. That narrative somewhat holding on after such a huge influx last year. So we saw the sector added jobs at entertainment places, at museums, at amusement parks. And we'll also be keeping a closer eye on that wage growth that we see across the category. Of course, in January, wages increase in across 22 states across the U.S. And I know that later on today, we'll be hearing more about that increase in wage growth coming in California for fast food joints in particular. Brad, back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Anjali, Danny, Brooke. We appreciate the breakdowns there, sector by sector. Let's switch gears to a trending ticker on Yahoo Finance, Costco. Costco shares, they are falling pre-market after missing analyst expectations for revenue in its second fiscal quarter. The big box retailer did, however, beat estimates in its same store sales, rising 5.8% compared to the 5% that was expected. Joining us now for more on, this resort, more on these results, we've got Noah Rohr, who is the Morningstar Equity Analyst here. I mean, Noah, if we kind of 
draw a through line between what we were just talking about with the employment situation and Costco's earnings. I mean, retail, that was ultimately little changed over this last month. However, uh, you did see general merchandise retailers really account for the majority of those gains in that particular sector here. As for Costco and how they talked about employment and the broader state of their business on the call, I want to know what jumps out most notably to you. Yeah, we think it was a really strong, really strong quarter again for Costco with comparable store sales in the U.S., excluding fuel, up 4.8 percent, up 9 percent in Canada, 8.2 percent internationally. So broadly, they just continue to attract consumers to their to their warehouses. And I think what's really, um, really encouraging is really the composition of that comparable store sales growth, right? They continue to drive four or five percent traffic to their stores. So as they continue to lever, uh, continue to grow their volumes in their warehouses, they can continue to lever their fixed costs and just sort of reinforce this flywheel and just strengthen their competitive advantage, their cost advantage over time. So we think it was a really strong quarter again. You still have a market perform rating on the stock. This is a stock that's up about 55% over the past year. What's fair value to you when it comes to Costco? Yeah, so our fair value estimate on Costco right now is 480 per share, which our, our fair value estimate implies about a 30 times price to earnings multiple. Um, really not necessarily an indictment on, on the company. We think the growth outlook for, for Costco is still very strong. And as I mentioned, we think that this quarter just sort of reinforced it, its wide moat rating that we were the company, um, but the valuation to us does seem a bit stretched. To what extent is Costco an indicator from your perspective of, of the broader economy right now, especially as we think about the consumer? Yeah, I think I think Costco's consumers are, Costco's core consumer tends to probably hold up a little bit better than, than the average consumer. And, and I think as maybe as, as uh, consumers start to feel a little bit more tightness um, in, in terms of the broader economy, we could see volume continuing to increase at, at Costco. So potentially um, we could see Costco kind of benefiting from, from a tighter macro environment or a little bit slower consumer spending. And, and we've heard that with, with Walmart and, and Target too. They, they've mentioned that consumers are more value conscious. And we think as people kind of keep going to Costco, that, that sort of reinforces that view. No, when it comes to the positioning of Costco, really what it tells us more broadly speaking about the consumer narrative right now, we heard from President Biden last night in the State of the Union address. He's talking about the fact that consumers have been resilient. They still remain extremely confident from the retailers that you cover specifically within the consumer staple space. What are some of the trends that you're seeing? What is that indicative to you just in terms of the strength of the consumer at this point? Yeah, I think broadly speaking, the consumer is still pretty strong, right? And 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 that showed up in in the retail sales. I know it was a little bit softer last month than expected, but generally speaking, um, across our coverage, management teams and companies seem to say that consumers are a bit more stretched than they have been over, over the past few years. But they're still spending; they still have money in their pockets, and they are seeking out value a little bit more. But Generally, they continue to spend. So, so overall, I think the consumer is still doing okay at the moment. As of right now, I mean, we're watching shares pre-market lower by about three percent. Costco over the past year to date, or, or even even over the past year, if you look back that far, up sixty percent. At what point do you believe that it's time for some of the investors out there to consider taking profits, or is there a next leg higher that they should remain locked in for? Yeah. Again, kind of going back to our fair value estimate, we, we do have it at, at 480 per share. So we do think that the valuation has gotten stretched. Obviously, Costco is, I don't want to say recession proof, but maybe a bit more recession resistant, resistant, so to speak, um, just given their low price value proposition and that resonates with consumers. So we could, I think we'll still continue to see the business performing well. Um, but we do think that the valuation is, is stretched at the moment. Noah Rohr, who is the Morningstar Equity Analyst, thanks you so much for helping us break down Costco this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Certainly.
All right, everyone, we've got all your markets action straight ahead when we begin Yahoo Finance's 9 a.m. hour. Here's just a look back at some of those February jobs report numbers here. The non-farm payroll headline print coming in at 275,000. That is above expectations. And then the un un unemployment rate, rather, you saw that come in at 3.9%. That is also above expectations, but not in a good way. 3.7% <laughs> uh, is what the street and the consensus was looking for there. Average hourly earnings year over year coming in in line. We'll see you at the top of the 9 a.m. It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolios. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. Happy Friday, everyone. We've got a big show for you today. Another jobs day in the books. Stock futures moving higher this morning after the headline. Non-farm payrolls number came in hotter than expected, but the unemployment rate is up. Hourly earnings, we have been expected. Prior two prints revised lower as well. We'll tell you what the numbers mean here and what they could imply for the Fed's rate cut plan. President Biden addressing the nation last night. The president taking the opportunity to tout America's economic recovery and the state of the consumer. So let's get right to it with the three things that you need to know. Your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, Madison Mills, and Brooke De Palma have more. Hey, Shauna, another hotter than expected jobs report. The U.S. economy creating more jobs than expected in February, adding 275,000 jobs versus the 200,000 that was expected. That's according to new data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But the labor market showing some signs of softening. We did see the unemployment rate tick up for the first time in four months, hitting a two-year high of 3.9%. And average hourly wages coming in at 4.3% in line with expectations. 
And stocks reaching new highs, even in the pre-market trade in the green here this morning, not just off that jobs report that Josh was talking about, but also due to some rallying we're seeing in the semiconductor space as those earnings fueling AI hype, the S&P notching a record close, tech-heavy Nasdaq just shy of a record. Companies posting record highs at the close Thursday include, of course, those AI darlings. We've got NVIDIA, Micron, and Broadcom. But that's even with tech stocks posting their biggest weekly outflow flows on record, according to Bank of America analysts. So that just shows the latest example of the bifurcation that we are seeing in the tech heavy names here. And all eyes were on President Joe Biden Thursday night. Biden delivering his annual State of the Union address to a joint session of Congress, where he covered an array of topics, including the state of the consumer and his optimism on the economy. Consumer studies show consumer confidence is soaring. Wages keep going up. Inflation keeps coming down. 15 million new jobs in just three years, a record, a record. And with most annual addresses, President Biden did weigh in on how he plans to gear up for the November election and how he plans to beat former President Trump. Good morning, everyone. Getting to our top story of the day, the February jobs report. Non-farm payrolls coming in hotter than expected. 275,000 jobs added versus the 200,000 that were anticipated. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer joins us at the desk with more. Hey, Josh. Yeah, Brad, it seems like the big takeaway here is really to sort of look past that headline beat that you saw on the non-farm number and sort of hone in on some of the other numbers you're seeing here, specifically the revisions we saw to last month. Remember, we initially had 353,000 jobs added in January. That got revised down by more than 100,000 gains. So when you zoom out and look at the broader picture, the labor market not really running as hot as some people thought. I thought Andrew Hunter over at Capital Economics explained sort of the report well in some, saying there's less reason now to be concerned about renewed labor market strength that will drive inflation higher. You have wage growth coming in a little bit lower than had been expected on a month to month basis. Again, you take a look at that non-farm number. And then guys, the unemployment rate at 3.9% is the highest level we've seen in the last two years. That, like, that is now back up to a level that is something we haven't been seeing on a consistent basis. First time it's come up in four months. So I think overall, if there was any concern that we were, that the labor market was getting too hot again, it seems like this report at least settles that for now. Josh, do you think that this, uh, the market obviously taking this, at least initially, as good news here, given the mixed spring, given the fact that once you dig into uh, dig into this report, some of those very key figures are were softer than what the street had maybe been anticipating. Is this report then exactly what the market wants to see at this point? It seems like if you want a Fed rate cut in May or June, this is your report, right? That was what Neil Dutta over at Renaissance Macro said. He called it one for the doves. And in that sense, essentially saying that if you want a cut to come in May or June, remember part of that base case is at least some level of softening in the economy, mm -hmm. right? We can't sit at a 3.7% unemployment rate, have people keep making more money and people keep getting more jobs and not be worried about inflation. So I think if you zoom out, the soft landing narrative always had a little bit of weakness coming in the labor market, right? So seeing a little bit of weakness doesn't mean we should panic, but it is sort of helpful if you're looking for a Fed rate cut to come sooner rather than later. So all right, Josh, thanks so much for breaking down that for us. We want to stick with the big story of the day, the jobs number coming in just above expectations, at least on the headline print. 275,000 jobs added to the month. The street have been looking for 200,000, showing some strength in the workforce. But we got to point out that that unemployment rate did tick higher to 3.9%. The average hourly earnings on a month-over-month -month basis coming in just below what the street was looking for, a tenth of a percent rise. Well, ahead of all this early Earlier this week, Bank of America raising its year-end target for the S&P to 5,400 from 5,000. The bank seeing improved sentiment for the year and also expecting maybe some broadening action in terms of leadership. So let's talk about how this report fits into that call and what we could expect for equities going forward. We want to bring in Jill Carey Hall, Bank of America's Securities a Senior U.S. Equity Strategist and Head of U.S. Small and Mid-Cap Strategy. It's great to see you here. So first, just your reaction to the print that we're getting. I was just asking Josh, our markets reporter, whether or not this is exactly the type of report that the street wants to see. What do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, I think our, our economists were forecasting 215,000, so a little bit above consensus, obviously came in stronger, but you did see a tick up in, in the unemployment, as you mentioned. So we are forecasting that the Fed will begin cutting rates in, in June of this year. So we're looking for, for three cuts this year, four cuts next year. Um, so, you know, we've still been in an environment where where the consumer is strong. You know, we expect inflation to, to begin to continue to cool. Um, but we do see the case that uh, the equity market is more likely to go higher than than lower from here. So I think equity market sentiment has certainly gotten more positive, but euphoria is not really what we're seeing in the broader market yet. It's been more concentrated in in pockets of the market. Um, you know, ver- themes that we've seen like AI and Magnificent Seven. Um, but when you look at the broader S and P five hundred, we we do see the case that you could see a broadening out of of leadership um, to the to the rest of the market outside of some of the large just stocks. Um, we also think that that small caps could could outperform this year, and and that's an area that typically does well after you've seen a very narrow market like we saw, you know, over the past year. Jill, it's clear that this is a Fed that doesn't want to be accused of being too quick to cut. And, and so, with that in mind, higher for longer has been what they've put out there in terms of their commentary and their tenor thus far. So now, if June is on the table. What does the rest of that pacing look like? And, and is there anything within that that the market is already expecting, already pricing in at this point? So we're looking for, for three cuts this year beginning in June um, and then four next year. I think when you know you look at the market today, the, the market has been trading at rather elevated valuations on the majority of metrics you track. So if we, we look at 20 different valuation metrics for the S&P 500, the market looks expensive versus history on 19 out of the, the 20. And I think you know when you when you look at valuation, it does matter. Um, it, it tends to be a better predictor of, of long-term returns than short-term returns. So we could definitely see lower than than average equity market returns over the next decade if, if you have a long time horizon, still positive, but call it 3% annualized returns over the next decade or what valuations are suggesting today. Um, that said, you know we, we could see valuations get, get more expensive near term. Um, certainly that could happen. We, we tend to be in an environment where you know the the market we, we think we're in an environment where the market has you know gotten higher quality um, you know it looks a bit different than it has been in in prior decades it's less levered so there could be reasons that we see uh, you know a lower equity risk premium than we've seen in prior decades um, and, and better normalized earnings power for the market so when it comes to the valuation concerns that we have started to uh, hear more and more about uh, rightfully so in some cases since the start of the year with the massive of run-up in tech last year, obviously continuing that momentum this year. Do you still see, I know you're expecting a broadening out of leadership, but do you still see technology, some of those larger cap tech names, being among the outperformers? Well, I think if you if you continue to see you know passive inflows into the market, this could certainly benefit some of the growth stocks. Um, but if we're in a if we're in an environment where profits growth is accelerating, and and that's what we expect that that corporate profits growth bottomed last year and it continues to improve and flex positively, you know that's an environment where value stocks tend to to lead. So you know if if overall growth is becoming more abundant um, within the market, then one doesn't need to pay up for expensive growth stocks. So so we do see the case for for value stocks. And, and I think investors have been very underpositioned in, in some of the themes that, you know, like cyclicals, like value, even, you know, high beta stocks, investors have been uh, very underweight relative to history. So, you know, we, we do see the case for leadership broadening out to some of these other parts of the market that, you know, haven't been very concentrated by investors recently. Jill, you also like some of the small and mid caps, the, the SMID as well, to outperform large this year. It hasn't necessarily been the case so far early innings of the year. Where do you expect that kind of trade to take hold? 
Sure. So yeah, the small caps did lag in January. Since early February, we have seen them start to outperform again. We do think that continues. Um, you know, when when you look at small caps, they have typically outperformed when when profits growth is accelerating. Um, when you've had periods following a narrow market like we did, um, we've also seen small caps. Uh, some of the indicators that are most correlated with small cap outperformance, like the you know manufacturing ISM index inflecting, uh, a lot of those indicators. Have, have been inflecting more positively. So, you know, the small caps are also an area that are a lot cheaper on a valuation basis relative to large caps. Um, you know, the the relative multiple of the, the Russell 2000 relative to the large cap index is still trading at, you know, multi-decade lows. So that's an area where we see more valuation upside um, and where we think you could see better returns this year. But we would still obviously focus on the, the higher quality small caps, um, you know, stocks that, that have earnings rather than no earnings, um, stocks that, that have better, uh, more predictable earnings. Jill Carey Hall, who's the Bank of America Securities a Senior U.S. Equity Strategist and Head of U.S. Small and Mid-Cap Strategy. Thanks so much for taking the time here. Appreciate it. Thanks. Well, time for today's Stock to Watch. More results from chip makers fueling the AI hype with Broadcom forecasting AI chip sales this year to reach $10 billion and Taiwan Semi posting strong sales to start 2024. Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills joins us from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with much more. Hey, Maddie. Hey, Brad, so quite a roller coaster evening for Broadcom, hitting a record high heading into yesterday's close. And then not a lot of positive movement left to come for them after their earnings print, which is interesting because they came in just in line with expectations. Terrible news for the street, which was expecting, of course, another record-breaking beat for this name, having seen all of these record-breaking beats throughout this earnings cycle from Broadcom's peers in the space, particularly NVIDIA is what we're talking about here. But I want to dig into why exactly we saw a little bit of weakness in Broadcom, because this is a name that has doubled over the past year obviously surging when you look at the stock year to date and hitting that record breaking high heading into this print so what exactly happened here and you can really look to exactly the same weakness that we've seen with Apple in terms of iPhone sales. That is one of the biggest clients of Broadcom, and so it's not really that big of a surprise that the profits related to this name did not uh, beat estimates heading into that earnings print. The iPhone sales weighing on this stock, and to me, it's just another indication of what we're gonna need to look at when you're sussing out the different performance of names within the semi space, which ones can hold up and kind of have some strength in response to the weakness that we're going to continue to see out of China. We're continuing to see customers there and even potential legislation there forcing customers to stick with Chinese-based names and suppliers of products. If that continues and comes to fruition, that's going to continue to weigh on names like this. Having said that, Broadcom did acquire VMware. That was another drain on some of their profits for this quarter, but is likely to lead to a lot of growth moving forward. And of course, this is an AI play, so likely some positive of growth to come if they can continue to beat out some of the weakness associated with those decreased iPhone sales. All right, Maddie, thank you so much. We'll check back in later on with you from the New York Stock Exchange. President Biden coming out swinging in defense of the U.S. economy's progress in his State of the Union address, touting his crackdown on corporations, shrinkflation, junk fees, and lowering consumer costs. But did it resonate? That's the big question. To break down what it means for Americans, Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman is here. Rick, I know you had your popcorn ready or, you know, maybe some snowcaps. Who knows? Uh, what did you take away from the State of the Union? Yeah, and the bag was smaller than it was last year because of uh, shrinkflation, of course. <laughs> Well, it was a good night. It was a good night for President Biden. I mean, he's getting very strong reviews. Uh, um, I, maybe the bar was set pretty low. People thought this might be a snooze fest or even worse, that he would really flub something up that would be a, kind of a negative viral moment for him. Didn't really happen. Uh, and he was uh, very energized last night. I mean, whatever vitamins he's taking, I think I want some of them. Uh, <laughs> the reviews today are using words like fierce, feisty, fiery. Um, uh, he looked very vigorous. Uh, and um, it was a very political speech. And, uh, you know, he, he referred to Trump. He never said the word Trump, but he referred to my predecessor 13 times. So he, he was completely in campaign mode. Um, and he did, you know, he did what we expected. He bragged about the U.S. economy. 
Um, uh, he said the U.S. economy is the envy of the world. I think that's true, more or less, except in America. Only Americans seem to think the American economy stinks, which is maybe the biggest problem he's going to have while campaigning is convincing Americans that the economy is as strong as he thinks it is and as strong as some of the data shows. Uh, but I think, you know, major takeaway here is he has now fully launched his 2024 reelection campaign. Uh, and if he can keep up this level of energy for the next seven months, uh, that would be uh, a relief for Democrats. We'll see if he can. Rick, do you think it's going to have an impact or how much impact do you see it having with some of the swing voters out there, which we know are going to be so critical in this election? Absolutely critical. And we're talking about a relatively small number of voters in perhaps only four or five or six uh, states. So uh, my own view, I mean, you know, official Washington, uh, the political press corps gets all excited about the State of the Union. Uh, my own view is um, this does not change minds. We're still far away from uh, election day. And anybody who actually is a swing voter is not going to make up their mind whether to vote for Biden or not based on what they see in this speech. And a lot of, you know, most Americans don't even watch the speech. But, I, you know, this will generate some good press coverage for Biden. Um, it already has, in fact. And, um, you know, I've seen um, some uh, analysts this morning saying this has kind of changed the narrative. It has uh, kind of put Biden on the on offense, maybe put Trump on defense. So um, Biden just needs to, I think he needs two things. He needs to keep this level of energy going uh, without any mistakes. And he needs the improvements in the economy that have been gradually um, coming along, mostly inflation, you know, um, getting that inflation rate down and getting people to notice that it's down. He just needs these uh, incremental trends to continue. Um, and if uh, if they do, um, Biden has a pretty good shot in November, but there's a lot that can change during the next seven months. Rick, just lastly, while we have you here, there was one point of contention that got at least some billionaires uh, getting Twitter fingers or X fingers. I'm not sure if that's going to really work uh, the, the, the way that, you know, I thought it would. But anyway, they got Twitter fingers, as we used to call it. Bill Ackman was the first one talking about drug prices here. And, and Biden mentioned this within his speech, talking about Americans paying more for prescription drugs than anywhere else. It's wrong. He's ending it. Bill Ackman chimed in on this. We saw Mark Cuban chimed in on this. And it kind of revives this general thought of, OK, for the billionaires that have already thrown some capital, some funding behind Nikki Haley previously, of these two candidates, where do we think that's going to net out? I think Biden would welcome attacks from billionaires. I mean, <laughs> if billionaires uh, don't like his agenda, I mean, that is exactly that. That's the kind of enemy you want to have if you're waging a, a populist uh, reelection campaign, which is what Biden is doing. Uh, in terms of people who are supporting, I, if, I think the money behind Nikki Haley uh, is not going to go to Biden. I mean, those are she she, she is very conservative. Um, she she is nowhere near the uh, centrist or center left Democrat that Joe Biden is. So I don't think Biden's going to get that money, but I also don't think he needs it. Uh, Biden's campaign is extremely well funded at this point. Um, and by the way, Donald Trump's campaign is not. So if some of those wealthy donors just just sat out the election and did not um, help out Donald Trump or his uh, super PACs, um, uh, that would that would benefit Biden. And I have a I have a hunch that is the way it's going to go. By the way, I did see one survey uh, recently that said some people who um, supported Nikki Haley, perhaps more of them are inclined to vote for Biden than for Trump. Um, that would be terrific news for Biden, because that is exactly the type of uh, fence sitting voter that he needs to get in order to win. Well, we will see how this all plays out over the next several months. Rick Newman, always great to have you. Thanks so much for hopping on with us today. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Costco, one of the top trending tickers on Yahoo Finance this morning. The stock under pressure in the pre-market action. Sales, gross margins, missing the street's expectations. Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma here with the details. Brooke, it looks like it's a bit of a disappointing quarter here, at least in the street's view. Yeah, many experts saying the valuation seems a bit too stretched here. Joe Fellman of Telsey Group telling Yahoo Finance this morning, Tocasso's stock has been on fire lately, so it only makes sense that it'll take a bit of a pause here. And this typically does happen after Costco reports financial news. They said they're not concerned given the business's uh, quite solid results here. And adjusted earnings per share coming in higher than the street expected. Revenue uh, growing 5.75% to $58.44 billion last quarter. That's slightly lower than expectations, as we noted at the top. But same-store sales jumping 5.8% uh, year over year. In the U.S. in particular, same-store sales did see growth. They come, came in higher than the street expected at 4.8%. Foot traffic here in the U.S. also up year over year, 4.3 percent. Um, and then if you take a closer look at those digital sale numbers, we did see them grow 18 percent year over year. And that's really a hot commodity on the street. Many discussing this as Costco really makes way into the next generation for consumers. They did see on the e-commerce platform the demand for gold, for silver and appliances were very, very strong. They also noted that gift cards and e-tickets also saw a rise in interest last quarter. He noted that Costco Logistics enjoyed record-breaking deliveries and that they are making improvements on their app. And they did roll out Apple Pay last week. So Costco certainly looking to move into the future here. I always take a closer look at those membership fees, a key revenue stream for the wholesale giant. They came in at $1.11 billion. That is a jump from the previous quarter that we saw. And renewal rate, a key metric that the company also takes a look at in the U.S. and Canada. We saw that rate come in at 92.9 percent. And the CFO Richard Galanti saying on the call that all metrics are going in the right direction for them potentially to increase membership hikes. He said it's a measure of we will at some point, I'm sure do it, but not yet. Costco also making a big push internationally. They did open their sixth store in China last quarter. And a fun fact here in the food courts, guys, they switched the churro for a chocolate chip cookie, five and a half ounces, and they're also playing around with a sushi store. They opened up their first one in Washington. Ooh. What do you think? I'm going to revolt. Yeah, I want the churro. <laughs> Keep the churro. I love a good chocolate chip cookie. I was going to say. Enough places you got chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> you, can, you can go to Insomnia. You can go to all these other places. This is all 49. Don't touch the salmon though. and you're happy. Yeah, just don't touch that pesto butter salmon. You have spot on. Good. Brooke, thanks so much here. <laughs> I really just want to see the visual of that gold bar again. That, the Costco gold bar. Do we really viral well for that? Asking you shall receive here on Yahoo Finance. Thank you so much to our control room for that satisfying my wishes. All right, Brooke, thanks so much. <laughs> Let's take another look at another trending ticker that we're tracking here this morning. Rivian shares of RIVN. They're higher by about 5%. They've announced plans to halt the building of its new factory in Georgia. But the bigger news here, they've introduced new EV models getting praise from the street. Truist saying halting its new factory is the prudent decision given the current capital environment. And RBC saying Rivian is creating a truly unique brand identity here. All right, so as for the details, because we were talking about this yesterday just a little bit, as this was one of the top trending tickers, now two days in a row, essentially, on the Yahoo Finance platform. The R2 is their new all-new midsize here. Performance, capability, utility, 5C package is what they're focusing. And then R3 is a midsize crossover that they call tidy on dimensions. Never heard that description before, but Rivian found a way. And the pricing for R2 is expected to start at about $45,000 here. Yeah, I mean, this was a dramatic move to the upside yesterday, the biggest gain that we have seen in quite some time. The RBC analyst, Tom Narayan, you mentioned those some of his comments briefly there at the top, but he was also attributing some of the gains that we saw yesterday due to the fact of short covering here, explaining a little bit of the pop again. We're seeing a move even higher today of nearly 6% in pre-market action. You got to keep in mind, though, this is a stock that has been under a tremendous amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. Shares are down more than 50% this year. We know that we have talked time and time again, concerns about Rivian's cash, also consumer demand for its products going forward. That has weighed on the stock's performance since the start of the year. Over the last six months, you're looking at a decline of just about 46%. So yes, the announcements yesterday at least met with some excitement on the street. We're seeing that share, uh, we're seeing that pop in the stock. But again, 
again, when you take a look at the performance at the start of the year, take a look at the performance of the last six months, which is up on your screen, this stock at very depressed levels compared to where it had been trading previously. Yeah, that's your classic womp womp chart pattern right there. <laughs> All right, get right here on Yahoo Finance. We're going to have more on that jobs report. The headline number coming in hotter than expected. Yahoo Finance sits down with Acting Labor Secretary Julie Sue when we come back. That's the opening bell here on this Friday, International Women's Day. You've got State Street ringing the opening bell at the NYSC, the New York Stock Exchange, ticker symbol STT. And you've got the Muslim American Leadership Alliance ringing the opening bell at the NASDAQ MALA. All right, excellent group there. We've got, and I believe they had some fun funfetti in the air. We've got coverage of the biggest market movers following the opening bell on Wall Street. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is standing by at the Interactive. Hey, Jared. Hey, Brad, big move up in the NASDAQ. Uh, actually, small caps of Russell 2000 up almost 1%. The NASDAQ, decent gains of about three-tenths of a percent. And the Dow, just a little bit underwater. And when we take a look at the sector action, we can see real estate, which was the number one sector before we opened, still the number one sector of the day, followed by consumer discretionary materials, industrials, tech, communication services, Staples Energy and healthcare trading to the downside. But America wants to know where Bitcoin is. And so let's take a look at our crypto heat map. Bitcoin up 1% over the trailing 24 hours. Here's where it is over the last seven days, pushing up against those highs that we saw earlier in the week. So no new record high just yet today, but about 68,000 on your radar. And we also got to check gold prices because for day number seven, this is day number seven of this rally of 3% over the last three months. And this week alone, gold futures up 2.83% to 2177 and 40 cents, guys. All right, Jared, thanks so much for breaking that down for us. Well, the Labor Department's February jobs report here coming in slightly hotter than expected. 275,000 jobs were added to the economy last month. Unemployment, though, ticking a bit higher, up to 3.9%. We want to head to the Labor Department, where Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schaumberger is joined by Julie Sue, Acting Labor Secretary. Jen. Hey, thanks, Shauna. That's right. I'm joined now by Acting Labor Secretary Julie Sue. Secretary Sue, always great to see you. You do. Thanks so much for joining me. So the top line non-farm payroll number coming in stronger than expected. But yet again, we saw large downward revisions to the prior months, the unemployment rate ticking up. Is the job market gently cooling in line with some of the anecdotal evidence that we've been seeing? I'll put it this way. I think this is another strong 
jobs report showing just how um, astounding the recovery has been uh, since President Biden came into office and how we are in a in a, in a point of continued sustained growth. So 275,000 jobs added last month. The unemployment rate remains under 4%. So now it's been under 4% for over two years running. It has not been like this in 50 years. And labor force participation continues to grow up, uh, to go up. And so, uh, you know, all around, this is a sign of just how um, how strong our, our economy is. And remember, none of this was promised, right? None of this was, in fact, most people predicted the opposite. And so I think this is what it happens when you have strong, steady leadership with a vision. And that's what President Biden has provided. When you look at the source of job growth over the past month, again, the lion's share coming from the government and health care, as we've seen over the past months, what does that tell you about the strength of the well, job market? I think it's important to note that the jobs growth is fairly broad based, right? It's multiple industries. It is in healthcare. Right? Hospitals have, have seen, uh, uh, saw major growth in the last month. We also saw in restaurants and bars. We saw an uptick in transportation and warehousing. We saw social assistance. So even if you pull out the government jobs, there's over 200,000 jobs created last month. And so I would say this is a continued, um, you know, a broad-based recovery, not limited to certain industries, and uh, and 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 that's again a, a part of how we define economic strength. And this is in line with a soft landing, you think? I think this is like you know the the very definition of the softest landing you can imagine. Last night, President Biden gave his State of the Union address, and he has proposed raising the corporate tax rate, raising the minimum corporate tax rate. How do you expect, if that were to occur, it would impact job creation and job growth? Could it hurt? So President Biden talked about everyone getting their fair share, right? That's what he's talking about when he says, we should not have uh, billionaires paying less in taxes than a teacher or a firefighter. And so what we have certainly seen over the last three years, and 2023 was a big year for this, is that when workers get their fair share, it's better for everybody the strong labor market that we saw last year, the continued growth that we see is in the very same moment that workers are you know, demanding and winning more, uh, you know, higher wages, uh, better retirement security, health benefits and the like. So I don't think that we, um, what, what we've seen demonstrates the choice between corporations paying their fair share and job creation. In fact, uh, under President Biden's uh, vision for the economy, they really go hand in hand. In addition to it being the day after the State of the Union and Jobs Day, today is International Women's Day. And I know you and I have talked a lot about women in the economy. Labor force participation for women reached an all-time record high last spring. Mm -hmm. But despite that, the pay gap between men and women remains wide. Women only earning 83 cents on the dollar versus men, even as wages have continued to grow at a strong clip. So why has progress stalled? Why is the pay gap still so wide? Right. So um, the first point about women's labor force participation rate remains important. Right. Women have powered this economic recovery. We've talked about this several times. Women's labor force participation rate for prime age women in the last month was almost at the all time high again, almost uh, match that that you talked about last spring. But yes, the pay gap remains persistent and we have to do everything we can to to, to, to end that. Right? It's unfair. And we see that women, even if you have the same level of education, uh, you're working in the, in the same type of job, in the same industry, um, women's pay statistically is lower than that than that of men. Now, some of that is old fashioned discrimination and, and we have to address that. But some of it is really the occupational segregation that persists. So women uh, in industries where the pay is lower, care work, for example, right? We talk about we have to build a care infrastructure that meets the needs of working people. And a lot of them are working women um, and that also increases the quality of those care jobs. Right? That's how we are going to make sure that women can fully participate. We did a study that showed that if this country invested in paid leave and other policies uh, that are family supporting and also in care, like child care, that five million more women would enter the labor market. That's $775 billion in economic activity each year. So those investments pay off. And I think you know we have to think about what are the costs if we don't get those things right. And that's why the president 
president also last night called for some of those policies. And before I let you go, Secretary Sue, you're headed to North Carolina next week, is that right, mm -hmm. to uh, talk about raising the quality of jobs for women in this country? Yeah. Everywhere I go, that is a theme. Again, you know, there is, it, it's a matter of equity. It's also a matter of being smart, right? We need, um, you know, th there's job, almost 15 million jobs created since the president came into office. Everywhere I go, employers say, you know, how, how am I going to find the workers? And one way is to tap into the full talent of the American people. And women want to work. I see this everywhere I go. It's demonstrated in the overall macro numbers, but also when I talk to women, women are in, in training programs, trades women, right? Women in the trades who are getting their hands dirty and laying pipe 30 feet underground and building buildings hundreds of feet in the air. They're doing jobs that aren't traditionally, have, haven't been traditionally thought of for women, mm -hmm. and women are demonstrating that when given a shot, we can do anything. And so we, everywhere I go, we're making investments in and, and promoting um, the, the, the strength and the resilience and the talent of women. Secretary Sue, thank you so much as thank always you. for your insight. Thank you we'll so much. We'll see you soon. That's acting like we're Secretary Julie Sue. I'll send it back to you in New York. All right, our thanks to Jennifer Schomburger for bringing us that interview. Appreciate it. Everyone, we've got much more coming up here on Yahoo Finance. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. Retailer Gap delivering profits in its holiday quarter that topped expectations. CEO Richard Dixon telling Yahoo Finance that the company is seeing early signs of a reinvigorated business. Shares are higher by a little more than 4% here. Here to discuss the progress in Gap's turnaround efforts, we have TD Cowan analyst Jonah Kim 
Great to have you here with us today. First and foremost, you think about the quarter, you listen in to the call last night. What is your takeaway about where this company is and it is in that reinvigoration broader plan? Yeah, certainly. Thanks for having having me today. Certainly, the company's on the path of improvement. In Old Navy comping 2%, Gap comping 4%, I think is a very good sign. The thing that we are looking for is stability in the business and longevity of growth trends. Uh, certainly, Banana Republic and Athleta are still undergoing some changes, and the recovery is expected to happen more longer term. So I think those are the signs that we are looking for. But the margin improvement was very solid. Uh, gross margin was up 530 basis points for the year. It was up 380 basis, 80 basis points. So all those improvements are are quite impressive, but we are looking for signs of stability and just sustainable growth ahead. What's going to drive that, Jonah? I think it's really a combination of having very creative uh, marketing and on-trend products across all brands. Um, Old Navy is having, uh, uh, I think, a little bit of a refreshment with the Zach Posen as a creative director. Um, and the Gap brand, they're trying to find that, you know, cultural relevance uh, through uh, you know, TikTok and social media. So all of those combined, and I think the, the management team's really vision is changing. So those are going to be the key driver for sustainable top line. But obviously, specialty retail apparel is quite, you know, difficult to get the, the trend right. So it's a little bit difficult for us to recommend it at this time. But certainly, I think if Athleta and, and Banana Republic, if we are seeing solid signs there, uh, we'll get more confident in the stock. You know, it's really interesting that you mentioned those two words in, in cultural relevance for a company in Gap. And I know that this year they've got one of their biggest planned DAP Gap collaborations that's, that's set to come. You know, what do collaborations like that do in moving the needle in this reinvigoration plan and, and securing market share as well? Yeah, I think very one of the most important things now in, in the apparel market is getting the younger consumer as well. Uh, Gap is an old brand, but they, they've lost relevance with uh, younger consumers. So I think having those collaboration and being more viral on, on, on social media certainly helps. Um, having just the right trend products uh, without buying over buying on the inventory is also important for margin margin improvement. So all of those combined, I think, is uh, in top of mind for management team, but just the execution is what we are really looking for. Jonah, when you take a look at Banana Republic, those comp sales declining 4%. We're seeing progress in other parts of the business. Banana Republic, obviously, one of the lagging brands. What do you attribute that to? Yeah, they made a change last year um, in the in the past few years to really elevate the brand and having the price point higher. Obviously, I think that just coincided with consumers being more muted, and in, at that price point, there are a lot of competition as well. So, I think just all of those things combined has led to some some muted growth trends at Banana Republic, and I think it's really. If the gap turnaround and old navy turnaround are successful, maybe they can have the same playbook at Banana Republic. But I think just the higher price point in this type of economy is just a difficult play currently. What does the company need to do to get Athleta right? I mean, we think about what they said on the call and ultimately comps being down 10%. They did say that they lapped a period of heavy discounting that they previewed last quarter. but. Ultimately, as you think about this highly competitive environment where you're competing not only with Lululemon and Nike, but all of the other new incumbents that are selling well into digital footprints, whether that be on TikTok or Instagram. So what does Gap need to do to really stand out in, in a market that everyone's just kind of looking for stretchy pants out there? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of the key catalysts here is uh, Chris Brinkley, the creative director, is from Allo. Uh, which has had huge success in, in the market. So I think that's a key key catalyst going forward. And what's unique to Athleta is, you know, they are very focused on women and having that voice heard. So I think that focus is, is quite unique in the market. Um, and they do play a little bit below uh, Lululemon in terms of price point, and they can have their, um, you know, core products, I think, um, you know, resonating more with the consumer that look for a more woman-focused brand. So I think all of those things could drive this, this brand. It is quite important piece of gap for investors to have Athleta back to growth. 
and obviously have margins expand. So um, that's going to be one of the key drivers for the stock uh, to see this brand just recovering. All right, GD Cowan, analyst, Joanna Kim, thanks so much for taking the time to join us here Thank this you. morning. All right, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back. Shares of Traeger off just about 13% on the back of its quarterly results. The grill maker warning of softer demand this year, the latest sign of a more cautious consumer. Joining us now, we want to bring in Jeremy Andrus. He's the CEO of Traeger Grills. Jeremy, it's great to have you here. So the stock reaction, a lot of that uh, because of the guidance that you gave, expecting softer than expected demand for the year. Can you give us just a little bit more context about the spending trends that you're seeing from consumers and when you expect potentially to see that tick back up once again? Absolutely. Good to be here. Uh, I would start by saying uh, we, we had a, uh, a solid quarter in a tough environment. Uh, sales grew by 18 percent in the quarter. Uh, EBITDA grew from seven uh, million dollars to 13 million dollars over the prior year quarter, and if you step back and look at the year uh, in a uh, in 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 an eight percent decline on on top line, we grew EBITDA by 47 percent and and expanded gross margins by 200 basis points. So, I I, I say that to sort of set the context uh, for for the environment that we're in, which is. Uh, high ticket consumer durable is a tough, tough, tough space to be in in the moment. Uh, there was a lot of pull forward demand that came from the pandemic. Consumers were home buying. Um, and, and that's 
that's created some pressure on these categories, outdoor cooking included. And so uh, we, we've taken this moment uh, as, you know, as the industry sorts through the pull forward demand to really focus on financial health, financial flexibility, uh, to drive profitability, to, to create a more efficient P&L with better margins. And that feels like the prudent thing to do in this environment. Uh, in terms of the trend and sort of how we think about the industry longer term, I'd say a couple of things. Number one, this is a resilient industry. Americans have always cooked outdoors. Uh, it is, if you look at the last 20 years of, of, of market data, it's been a steady grower uh, with very few exceptions. And so uh, right now we're playing in, in an industry that's meaningfully smaller than the industry of 2019, and it will recover. Uh, our expectation is that as interest rates come down, uh, that, uh, and that that we return to growth, that the category returns to growth. And that for us feels like a moment in time to also lean more into growth type of investments. Jeremy, I wonder right now what, what type of order volume moderation you're seeing from your wholesale partners for the, the big ticket items, the, the known items that Traeger has made its way into many backyards and decks and porches uh, for years and, and how long that type of environment might last from your purview? Well, uh, look, the, uh, the, the, the industry accelerated meaningfully in 20 and 21, uh, and, uh, and it's declined the last two years. Uh, 2022, it declined high teens. Um, 2023, last year, declined high single digits. And we expect to see some decline in the industry again this year. Uh, our expectation is that in 2025, the industry begins to return to growth. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's fair to say that it is consistent with other similar industries. Uh, you know, we've heard um, uh, Home Depot on their earnings call a couple of weeks ago suggested weakness in high ticket consumer durables. We play in a similar space. And so uh, it will return to growth. Calling the, the timing is not an easy thing to do. Uh, but we do believe that. Um, at some moment, we do we return return to more traditional replacement cycles. Uh, interest rates uh, tend to stimulate uh, purchasing uh, in, in in high ticket durables. Uh, consumers do tend to finance these things. Uh, uh, it seems like, uh, based on everything we're seeing in the macro and sort of commentary from the Fed, that that we start to experience some uh, some some reductions in interest rates this year. And so, you know, we still look at this year and say, let's make sure that we're focusing on what matters for Traeger. Uh, investment in product. We are investing uh, in product innovation because we're a disruptor. We win with great experience. Uh, community and brand. Mm -hmm. We have this incredibly passionate uh, base of consumers. You talk to a Traeger owner, first thing they'll do is pull up their iPhone and they'll start flipping through uh, the, uh, the the pictures of amazing food that they produced uh, last mm -hmm. night, last week, last month. And so, you know, in the moment, uh, we're very focused on what's sacred to our business, product investment, community engagement. And as we start to see the macro turn, in terms of high ticket durables, we'll begin to lean into top of funnel investments to drive more growth. Jeremy, what are you seeing just in terms of how re retailers are taking on inventory at this stage of the economic cycle? You know what, um, our, our, our retailers uh, for the Traeger brand are healthy in terms of inventory. And so we work very, very closely with them to ensure that they're carrying the right levels of inventory, particularly as we move into uh, our key season, uh, it, we, we really accelerate uh, during the second quarter. And so uh, I would say that Traeger was actually one to get back to a healthy inventory level sooner than our competition. And that's helped a lot. That's created a more productive conversation with our retailers to ensure that they're holding the right levels of inventory to support the demand. Jeremy Andrews, who is the Traeger Grill CEO. Jeremy, great to have you here with us. Uh, you've gotten us all hungry, so <laughs> I guess I got to do something about that now. Thanks. <laughs> Good to see you. Coming up, a strategist breaks down how investors should be digesting the jobs report. That's after the break.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. We are 30 minutes into today's trading activity. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Stocks are higher following February's mixed jobs report. Showed some resilience in the headline number and some signs of softening in the revisions. Investors now weighing whether this labor market means the timing of rate cuts could be pushed out, brought forward. We've got a lot of that debate continuing to, uh, continuing to wade through. All right, let's take a look at some of those individual trending tickers. First up, Nova Nordisk edging lower this morning after the CEO saying that he expects prices for weight loss drugs to fall as more people start taking these medications. Still, Nova Nordisk expects to maintain pricing power when it comes to the next generation products. Now, this comes after the Danish pharmaceutical giant surpassed Tesla in market cap on Thursday. And Coinbase ticking higher after getting an upgrade from Goldman Sachs to neutral from Cell. The analysts cutting the recent jump in Coinbase's stock as well as the company's commitment to more consistent profitability. This comes as Bitcoin hits fresh highs this week. All right, and Carvana shares surging after RBC upgraded the stock to sector perform from underperform, up just about 12% today. Now, the analyst is saying that investors are underestimating potential cash generation per car, and they think that will be a catalyst for the stock here going forward. Well, we are about 30 minutes into the trading day and taking a look at the major averages. You're looking at gains across the board. Now we got that headline print. They came in better than expected. Jobs growth surpassing expectations, but the unemployment rate rising for the first time in months and downward revisions to job growth for the prior two months, suggesting a cooling labor market. So what does this mean? For investors, who better to ask than Lizanne Saunders, Charles Schwab, Chief Investment Strategist. Lizanne, it's great to see you here. So I'm curious, just your first mm -hmm. take at this report and what the signals here for investors going forward. Well, to the, to the extent the you know doves and hawks have been fighting it out, I'd say this report uh, results in a dead heat. It, there's literally something for everybody in here. You know, at, at first blush, the payroll number was better than expected, but pretty significant downward revisions. The differential between the establishment survey, which generates payrolls, and the household survey, the household survey plunged again. That's three months in a row of declining household employment. Obviously, the unemployment rate jumped, but that's all non-prime age. You did see an increase in the prime age labor force participation. You, you saw in line with expectations wages, which is good from a Fed reaction function perspective, but it really was chock full of, of data that really supported any view or case you have. And, and so what does that in the case set up for the Fed uh, at their next meeting? How does this perhaps move the needle one direction or the other? I don't think this particular report moves the needle one direction or another. Right now, we've got about a 25% probability based on the Fed Funds futures market of a, of a cut in May. I still think that seems a little bit premature unless we get a much more dovish read on CPI and PPI next week. Um, absent that, it looks a bit more likely to be June. That's got about a 60% probability right now. But when you have a data-dependent Fed, it means they and we are all at the mercy of data. And I think what was nice to see is you didn't get another real really hot jobs report to follow on what was last month's hot pretty much across metrics. But that followed a really hot CPI report. So best case scenario, obviously, would be a little bit of a cooling in both uh, CPI and PPI. And that the combination of those reports could potentially move the needle in terms of May versus June. Liz, we've been talking so much this week and really at length over the last several months about the run up that we've seen and just a handful of names, a lot of the excitement driven by uh, the AI rally. What do you make of current valuation levels? And given the fact that if we were to see a rate cut before maybe in May or June, like you were potentially saying here, do you have any concerns, I guess, about where valuations are today? So, you know, if rates start to move down, all else equal, that's beneficial for valuations. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at um, the history of valuation levels, uh, the, the macro condition that tends to drive them, other than just you know market sentiment is inflation and the sweet spot for inflation as it relates to more elevated valuation levels or a market that can support that is maybe not coincidentally around that 2% uh, zone that the Fed is looking for as well. We're not there yet. 
That said, valuations are are stretched. But as I said, valuation, first of all, should never be a market timing tool. Not that there's anything that is a, a an accurate market timing tool, but valuation is as much a sentiment indicator, an indicator of, of sentiment as it is some you know fundamental timing type tool. And if you do X out some of the mega cap earnings leaders, you'd have a more reasonable valuation. The problem is if you X out the earnings of those mega cap leaders, you also go back down a negative territory for earnings. So it works in, in both directions. But the broadening out we're seeing that's happening in a little more stealthy a way, the unbelievable dispersion in the Magnificent Seven this year with NVIDIA still at the top, a Tesla at the very, very bottom. The fact that the average NASDAQ member stock has actually had a 23% drawdown this year relative to only 3% at the index level. So there's a lot of churn going on under the surface, uh, which is not a bad thing in terms of what it suggests about maybe some broadening out. Lizanne, I remember doing a write-up earlier this year, maybe it was tail end of last year, just trying to preview what could really outperform. And, and the comments that I got continuously uh, resounded around small caps, and, and yours was one of them. I remember that discussion here. But now, if we, and I look back through some of your tweets this week, there's clearly been uh, an outperformance that those large caps have still had compared to small caps. Where do we expect perhaps some of that turnover to take place? Is it dependent on that first Fed rate cut? Well, first of all, small caps is a giant category. So to say, for anyone to say, I like small caps or I don't like small caps, I think a little more specificity is probably warranted there. You've got, I don't know, 1,800 and some odd stocks within the Russell 2000, and between 30 and 40% are some combination of zombie companies that don't have the cash flows to pay interest on their debt and or non-profitable companies. So I think going down the cap spectrum, you still need to stay up in quality. But over the past month, uh, whether it's a Russell 2000 or the S&P 600, which is a higher quality small cap index, outperforming the S&P. S&P equal weight, outperforming S&P cap weight. So again, you wouldn't necessarily notice it by just looking at index level returns, but you've had this stealthy rotation under the surface that has been supportive of areas other than the Magnificent uh, Seven. So I think there are opportunities outside of that small group, even into small caps, but I think you decidedly want to stay up in quality. And just hmm. to reiterate, the S&P 600, not that I'm recommending it as an index investment, but that S&P uses a profitability filter when they construct the S&P 600. So it's inherently a higher quality, call it start point or index than the Russell 2000. Well, then when we talk about the broadening that we're starting to see in leadership, of course, looking ahead several months from now to the 2024 election, do you expect that to stoke some volatility in the markets? And what would your advice to investors be? It is possible that that the election, it's not just the U.S. election, mm -hmm. there are elections in a lot of places, more than 40 percent of the global population is represented by, uh, or is, lives in a country that has an election this year. So uh, it's, I don't think it's a stretch to say it could be a volatility driver, especially in the equity market, because volatility has been so low. You tend to see more movement at the sector level as it relates to, you know, candidates and policy positions. But I, I think it's it's sort of fraught with, with peril trying to trade around that kind of stuff, not to mention the fact that no matter what happens in November, the, the division in Congress or the majorities are likely to be fairly narrow. So there, there's probably a big difference between policy proposals and the chances of policy enactment. But most of the action tends to be at the sector level. And I, I, I'd expect to see that again, but also maybe some volatility from a bigger picture perspective. But don't try to trade around it. Lizanne, always great to get some of your insight and perspective. Thanks so much Thank for you. taking the time here today. Lizanne Saunders, Charles Schwab, Chief Investment Strategist. Appreciate it. Coming up, everyone, we got a hotter than expected headline number from the February jobs report, but some key revisions. How is AI impacting the labor market? We're going to break that one down and discuss next.
the February jobs report showing some softening in the labor market with the unemployment rate ticking higher for the first time in four months. But the headline number, non-farm payrolls, that actually came in hotter than expected. 275,000 jobs were added during the month. So there's one job area in particular that we want to focus on here. AI. As the hype around artificial intelligence escalates, AI jobs alone are showing an increase in demand up 42% since the low in December 2022. That's according to the University of Maryland researchers. For more on the state of the labor market, we're joined by Peter Quigley, who is the Kelly president and CEO. Peter, great to have you here with us this morning. You know, when we think about where these new roles are going to come about, what the skill sets are, uh, and, and where this is really taking on some prominence, what are you seeing from, from what you're tracking in the broader employment situation environment? Well, in terms of AI specifically? Absolutely. Yeah, so um, we're seeing the introduction of AI in uh, almost all of the sectors that we support um, because of the uh, rapid adoption. Um, you know, it took uh, Instagram, I think a year and a half to get to a, a 10 million users um, and uh, generative AI took it uh, two months. So the I think that's 100 million users actually. Um, so the adoption rate is considerable. Um, there are clearly going to be jobs that are eliminated due to um, AI. Uh, Challenger Gray and Christmas for the first time last May and their layoff report cited AI as a reason for layoffs. Um, but by and large, I think um, we're going to see more jobs created than we are destroyed, which is a view held by the World Economic Forum. Um, McKinsey printed a, 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 issued a report. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing when we talk to our customers, that AI is an opportunity to enable uh, greater productivity, greater engagement, the reduction in routine tasks for uh, their employees, uh, and that uh, with the proper use of guardrails and guidelines, which are very important in the application of AI, um, I think it's going to overall be a positive for the workforce. Peter, I'm curious, as a staffing agency, what are you hearing from employers? Are they able to find the AI tech workers that they need or want to build that part of the business now? Yeah, clearly not. Um, you know, the number of, of job openings or job postings that required some sort of artificial intelligence, not just generative artificial intelligence, but this dates back to the five, five six years ago, they've tripled and they're growing exponentially as we speak. Um, you know, a chat GPT prompt engineer is a job that didn't even exist a year ago. And yet uh, those jobs are proliferating um, because companies are finding um, a need to figure out how uh, they're going to apply this technology uh, to improve their business results. Um, we've launched a technology platform at the, at the request of our customers um, to match uh, individuals with AI experience and uh, customers that need that. And uh, I think there's going to be, a, you know, more and more of uh, trying to find people who have um, AI experience to connect with uh, companies whose demand is growing every day. Right now, it's employees who have AI experience, but then you think further out and all of us in some form or another are going to be either working with an AI co-pilot or going to be engaging with some sort of generative AI in, in one capacity or another in, in our work. How does this improve productivity and where does this perhaps leave some roles exposed? Yeah, so the productivity, um, it really is about reducing um, routine time consuming tasks. Uh, writing a first draft of something, doing research on some uh, customer or product, um, being able to uh, create an agenda and a workday that is most optimized for any particular individual. Um, all of those applications are available today. In our own business, we found uh, use for um, creating interview questions for individuals or uh, creating a better job description to match uh, talent with our customers. Um, and those are routine tasks, time consuming tasks that take away from in our world, um, the recruiting world, uh, 
connecting our recruiters with the talent they want to place. And I think that is a, just an analogy for almost any job where um, a AI can um, replace routine tasks. Jobs that are going to be Im impacted, uh, financial analysts, um, court reporters, uh, anything that uh, tends to be uh, tax preparers um, that has a lot of repetition and uh, a lot of uh, data analytics will be uh, potentially replaced. On the other hand, uh, there are jobs that are going to benefit uh, content writers who no longer have to generate content, but will be able to focus on the user interface and the, the interaction with the end user. All right, Peter Quigley, thanks so much for joining us here this morning. CEO and President of Kelly, thanks. Thank you. Well, we got much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. President Biden taking the stage last night for his third State of the Union address. The president making his case to the American people ahead of the 2024 election. One key area for the White House, lowering the cost of housing for all Americans. Let's listen to his latest proposals. I want to provide an annual tax credit that will give Americans $400 a month for the next two years as mortgage rates come down to put toward their mortgages when they buy their first home or trade up for a little more space. Now pass and build and renovate 
2 million affordable homes and bring those rents down. And so how realistic are Biden's latest economic plans? Joining us now, we've got Isaac Boltanski, who is the BTIG Director of Policy Research. Isaac, always great to have you on here with us. Uh, first and foremost, let's just start there. What is the realistic nature of putting these plans into action here? And perhaps we should begin on the housing front, uh, given that that's the clip that we just played there. Yeah, look, on the housing side, I think that we can say with emphatic certainty that none of these tax proposals will become law. This Congress is effectively at, at its end. We're going to see a few fights over funding. We're going to see, hopefully, I think, passage of a very narrow tax bill. But none of the proposals that the president went through last night on the tax side are going to become law. And I think we also have to look at these through a political lens. Yes, they may be popular conceptually. But this country is suffering from a housing shortage. The issue here is supply. We are, there's a dearth of, by some estimates, 4 million houses. Uh, we need 4 million more units to keep up with, with demand. And so there's some befuddling element here as to why we would try to stoke demand, given that the real crisis is driven by supply. Isaac, I'm curious just to get your thoughts more broadly speaking on the tone that President Biden struck last night. You were just talking about some of the proposals that he walked through when it comes to housing. He also discussed that he wanted to raise the corporate tax rate. So, I mean, he has talked about time and time again to 28 percent, the corporate minimum tax to 21 percent. What is this ultimately going to do, do you think, in terms of the narrative and what we're going to hear from President Biden and his team as we get closer and closer to that election? The general election for 2024 has already begun. I think that's the message that we should take from the speech last night, coupled with the uh, results from Super Tuesday. And so the focus on the economic side, whether it was on the tax portion or on junk fees, which was a huge component of the speech as well, was intended to draw a contrast with former President Trump. That was the purpose. None of those proposals, at least legislatively, will become law. We'll continue to see administrative work on junk fees. Um, I think that's an area that investors should keep their eyes on because there is some wood to chop there. But everything else was simply meant to contrast this president with his predecessor. And it's going to be something that you're going to hear repeatedly on the campaign trail because that's an area where they think they can get young voters and independents to come over to their side. It's clear that there have been a couple other campaign talking points that are going to continue to emerge here. One of them was really on the unionization front as well here. And as that relates to the employment situation, it's clear where Biden wants to lean into the amount of jobs that are created, his pro-union stance. How much is that expected to move the needle and, and what type of policy will also need to be coupled with that? Yeah, look, there's something that I keep thinking about here, and it's it's that this isn't going to be an election that's determined solely by financial conditions. It's not going to be about how your wallet is faring. I don't think that we should look at this election through that singular lens. I think this election is going to be about anger and fear, right? You're going to have the Trump campaign saying, vote for us if you're angry about crime or angry about immigration or angry about inflation. I think the Biden campaign is going to say, vote for us if you're fearful of what Donald Trump can do for reproductive rights or for the future of democracy or our standing in the in the global order. And that's really going to drive it. So it's not a, a single uh, a single issue like the economy. I think it's far more complicated, as evidenced by polling uh, showing that immigration continues to rise as one of the most important issues for, for swing voters. So when will we finally hear about plans for either camp here to really put the idea of how they will or how their plan could actually work in, in realistic tenor. So we should get the president's budget next week. And I think that for that for that reason, investors and every and market participants should be ready for more headlines about taxes. So I've been telling my clients, don't worry, they're not going to quadruple <laughs> the tax on buybacks, even though you're going to hear more headlines about that. Um, but I, I think that this is going to be a slow bleed. This is something that we've got to uh, we've got to be prepared for a very, very long summer. And so these plans tend to take shape heading into the conventions, which will be uh, at the end of the summer. And, and at that point, I think we'll have a fuller picture of what the proposals are. 
Isaac, anything that you heard last night, did it change your view just in terms of the risk of a government shutdown and what we could see play out over the next week or two? Nothing last night changed how we're thinking about the next few weeks. I, I still think that the risk of a government shutdown are elevated. Um, it's great that they got six of the 12 appropriations bills done. That's wonderful. Uh, but the next six are the really tough ones. We're talking about uh, homeland security and defense and things that have real tough politics to them. So I still think that there, there is a elevated risk of a government shutdown. And I think that investors should look past it. I don't think they should care at all. Um, I think that the fiscal questions that investors are going to have to start wrestling with are going to come in to light in 2025. And that's when we're talking about the debt ceiling again. And when we're talking about 3.3 trillion in tax cuts expiring. Isaac Boltanski, always great to have you here at Yahoo Finance. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. BTIG's Director of Policy Research. Thanks. Well, President Biden taking a moment in his State of the Union speech to address plans to lower food costs for Americans. The president voicing the administration's efforts to crack down on shrinkflation. Take a listen. Too many corporations raise prices to pad their profits, charging more and more for less and less. That's our cracking down on corporations that engage in price gouging and deceptive pricing, from food to health care to housing. In fact, the snack companies think you won't notice if they change the size of the bag and put a hell of a lot fewer <laughs> same, same size bag, put fewer chips in it. No, I'm not joking. It's called shrinkflation. Pass Bobby Casey's bill and stop this. I really mean it. Here with more on what this means for the grocery landscape, we want to bring in Scott Moses. He's Solomon Partners, head of grocery, pharmacy, and restaurants, along with Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills. Great to have both of you here. Scott, let's talk about what we heard from the president last night. His focus was on shrinkflation, but it really gets to the heart of the matter, and that is the fact that millions of Americans are still paying much more for groceries than they were a year ago, than they were a couple of years ago pre-pandemic. Grocery prices are actually up 25 percent, 25 percent higher than they were in 2019. Are Americans going to see any relief at the grocery store soon? Well, first, thanks for having me. And, and I agree. Look, food inflation has been a real challenge for all of us. But we should focus on the real causes. So COVID, supply chain, various ecological shortages around the world, that brought food inflation to over 8% in February of 22. The Ukraine war brought it to 13.5% later that summer, and we all felt that. But the food manufacturers have been exacerbating matters by continuously taking price increases, and they talk about it freely in their earnings reports. And with shrinkflation, like the president said, we all feel cheated. Now, conversely, Kroger's business model is literally to lower prices. They've got a 20 year track record systematically investing over $5 billion to lower prices for customers, both company wide and with acquisitions like Harris Teeter and Roundy's. And with the Albertsons merger, Kroger's clearly committed to lower prices by several hundred million dollars more day one. So the merger is going to help millions of families across the country fight food inflation at the checkout line. Scott, we should also mention that you are consulting on the Kroger Albertsons potential deal as well. But having said that, I want to get more of your thoughts on this idea of price gouging. You mentioned that they're bringing it up in their earnings reports, but it makes sense in a capitalist world that companies are going to raise prices to whatever the market will bear. So given that condition, if you were advising the president or someone running for office right now, what would your advice be to them to get grocery prices lower, given that grocers don't have an incentive? to lower prices just because consumers want them lower? Well, my, my advice would be to let transactions or companies who've got a long track record of lowering prices continue to do that, right? Our grocery industry has changed radically over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, 10 of the top 15 American grocers were supermarket grocers. Today, there are only five of the top 15. The other 10 are national discount grocers like Walmart, Target. Costco, Amazon, and Whole Foods, Aldi, and Trader Joe's, Dollar General. And those guys have got 60% market share, and that is rising fast. So in order for supermarket grocers to continue to lower prices, they sometimes need to get bigger so they can have remotely the scale that some of those larger national gift discount grocers have got. Because I'll tell you, in the long run, those national discount grocers who now have got over 60% share they pose an existential threat to supermarket grocers, just like they've done with department stores. And that's not theory. We've all seen this over the last 20 years. 
What is the way that, and I mean, even as you're talking about their ability to compete against an Amazon, a Target, a Walmart, and, and Amazon for their own right, going out and purchasing Whole Foods back in 2017, $13.7 billion, you think about their ambition to really make sure that they cement themselves within that grocery landscape. For a Kroger or an Albertsons, what is the opportunity that they have to even continue as, as a business in the same way that we've known them to this point if this deal is not consummated? Well, you are absolutely right by pointing out the, the wide difference. So let, let's go through a few, a few examples. So Walmart is the world's number one grocer by a very, very wide margin, and they've got about 30% share here in the United States. They're three times the size of Kroger, three times Costco, five times Albertsons or Amazon, and roughly as large as all four of those companies combined. It's next four competitors. So Walmart clearly dominates U.S. grocery. It's twice as big as Kroger and Albertsons will be combined. Then there's Costco, the world's number two grocer, number three in the U.S., just behind Kroger. Most of what they sell are groceries, and 40% of American households are Costco members. And the average Costco store does five times the grocery sales of the average supermarket grocer. And then, like you said, there's Amazon and Whole Foods, the world's number four grocer, number five in the U.S., soon to be number four when they overtake Albertsons. And they had the same epiphany as Walmart did 30 years ago. If you want to be the world's number one retailer, you've got to be the number one grocer. Mm -hmm. And Alina Khan herself called Amazon a rival grocer in a New York Times op-ed that she wrote in June of 17 when they bought Whole Foods. And she was very prescient, just as you point out, in predicting just how important Amazon was going to be and just how detrimental they were going to be to regional grocers like Kroger and Albertsons. If the Kroger, Kroger Albertsons deal were to go through, I know that you anticipate that leading to lower prices and a projection of jobs. Talk me through the kind of opera operationalize that for me. How does that hit the consumer? If that deal does go through, how does that actually make my $5 avocados a little bit more affordable for me? Sure. Well, Kroger has said they're going to invest, as I say, several hundred million dollars day one. And the reason they can comfortably say that beyond the fact that they've done it consistently company-wide and with acquisitions over the last 20 plus years is because with mergers in the grocery industry, and I've been doing this well over 20 years myself, you get savings in procurement, in systems, in um, logistics, in various corporate contracts. And so it enables a company, if they're doing the right thing by their consumers, to pass those cost savings on. And that has been Kroger's business model consistently for the last 20 years. Solomon Partners, Scott Moses, along with Yahoo Finance and Madison Mills. We're going to have to leave the conversation there. We do need to figure out why Maddie's paying $5 for avocados here <laughs> in a moment. Uh, I mean, my last one was two seventy nine, I think. Thanks so much for taking the time here today, Scott. Thanks for having me. Take Same. care. Let's do a quick check of Bitcoin, taking a look at BTC USD. It's just hit another record high. As of right now, you're seeing it just below $69,000. Bitcoin has been on a tear this year, up over 57% year to date. And it's certainly been one of the larger trending business stories, financial stories, currency stories over the course of this week across social media as well. It certainly has. And as we've seen the price of Bitcoin rise, we have certainly seen many crypto related crypto tied stocks also riding that wave to the upside. Coinbase today, that crypto exchange, it's rallied 300 percent in the last 12 months. The move to the upside today, taking that stock up now and topping its direct listing price here as Bitcoin surges. We're also seeing gains from MicroStrategy, from Marathon Digital, from CleanSpark, among the winners within the crypto space as we see this rally that we saw starting in 2023 continue here throughout the start of the year. And again, Bitcoin closing out a record setting, about to close out a record setting week with another record here today. Yeah, I'm looking at this price spike that we saw, and this is on the Yahoo Finance platform. Everybody can go on there, do some advanced charting as well here. But this spike that took place Eastern time at around 10.30ish a.m. Eastern time, which pushed it to nearly $70,000 here. So we'll continue to watch this, of course, going into the weekend. Crypto markets don't close. All your market action, though, is straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Trouble at New York Community Bancorp puts regional lenders back in the spotlight nearly one year following the collapse of three high-profile banks. A surprise fourth-quarter loss sent shares of NYCB into a tailspin shortly after the start of the year. And now the struggling lender is getting a $1 billion infusion from a group of firms led by former U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin as it looks to regain investor confidence here. Now, some of the bank's troubles can be traced back to the crisis that unfolded 12 months ago. So let's take a look back here, Sean. All right, we will. Well, on March 8th, 2023, Silicon Valley Bank announced $1.8 billion in losses after selling investments to cover up increasing withdrawals. The next day, SVB stock crashed and people panicked, causing a bank run. By end of the day, depositors attempted to withdraw $42 billion. Now on March 10th, federal regulators seized SVB, not long after Signature Bank. Regional stocks plunged and President Biden addressed the nation, trying to reassure Americans that the banking system is safe. That's right. But confidence faltered. Several banks experienced issues. UBS, they agreed to acquire Credit Suisse to prevent it from collapsing. And First Republic got a $30 billion ejection from 11 banks. But it wasn't enough. Regulators, they seized the bank on May 1st, and it was sold to J.P. Morgan Chase. Well, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank Signature and First Republic represent three of the biggest bank failures in U.S. history. New York Community Bank Corp. took on some of the assets of the failed Signature Bank, absorbing billions in loans, pushing the lender above the $100 billion threshold that subjects banks to higher regulatory standards, including needing to hold more capital against future losses. That's right. And so NYCB now saying that it's the reason that it slashed its dividend and set aside more money. But loan loss money aside, the bank is under pressure because of its high exposure to commercial real estate, which has fallen significantly in value since the pandemic and the rise of remote work. So what does the road ahead look like for regionals? We're joined by Brent Beardall, who is the CEO of Wafed Bank. Thanks so much for taking the time. What does that road ahead look like from your purview? You know, put it this way, the road ahead looks a lot better than it did a year ago. Uh, regional banks are actually very strong. And I was so glad to see the infusion of capital in the New York Community Bank. I, it had some problems, and I think that capital will help address those problems. Brent, when we talk about the need for regionals here to reassure investors, skeptical investors who maybe aren't sure just about the risk that some of these regional banks who have a high exposure to CRE, what the road ahead could look like, what would your message to those skeptical investors be? Oh, thank you for asking the question. One, one of my favorite things to do is to try to educate people about commercial real estate. Commercial real estate is such a broad category. Literally, it means a thousand different things. What's in commercial real estate? You have office buildings, which of course is the highest risk right now. You also have uh, hospitality, you have hotels, you have apartments, you have uh, warehouses, you have self-storage facilities, you have car wash. It means so many different things. So to me, it's too broad of a category to say, hey, look how much exposure you have to commercial real estate. The question is, what kind of commercial real estate? And then once you understand what kind of commercial real estate, an investor really needs to know three things from my perspective. Number one, location. It's no secret, everyone knows that with real estate, it's all about location, location, location. If you are downtown San Francisco right now, you probably have a problem. And if you're in Bellevue, Washington, you're probably doing pretty well, or Salt Lake City. Most of the markets that we operate in, we all see the headlines of what's happening in these major cities and they have real problems, but you can't extrapolate that to the overall market. So number one is location. Number two is to understand how much equity these borrowers put into the deals because it tells you how, how long are they going to go along trying to solve the problem. If they have a lot of equity in the deals, they're going to be with you. They're going to work with you really hard to get it right. And then last, lastly is the sponsor. You need to understand how is the sponsor going to behave? Are they going to be quick to cut ties with you and say it's your problem? Or are they going to work with you through the problems? And so how does this materially change the propensity of regional banks to have the same type of commercial real estate exposure that they've had in the past versus passing that off to some of the larger banks? Yeah, well, I think the, the real question is, do we need to pass it off to the larger banks? Is it a problem? Hmm. Uh, for us at Wafed, we've now been on 
10, in the last 10 years, nine of those years we've had net recoveries. So we've only had one year of net losses. Think about that. Uh, on our commercial real estate book, we've almost had no losses in the last 10 years. So literally, if we decided strategically we wanted to change our focus from commercial real estate into another asset category, we're literally taking more risk. Is that what we want? So I would say don't just jump based on the headlines, but understand what kind of risk there is in the portfolios and where do you want to be? Commercial real estate has served us very, very well as regional banks, and I think we'll continue to do so. And one of the other things, if I could point out too, because one of the headlines about New York community is, you know, they got in trouble with commercial real estate and they did, but their issue is focused on apartments in New York City that have rent control. And when you have rates go up 500 basis points and then all of a sudden the debt service rises, if the landlords can't increase their rents to pay for that, that's where they get squeezed. And so I, we have just a handful of loans in our entire portfolio that have rent control. So it's not an issue for us or the majority of banks out there. From what is an issue for everyone on the street, but what is particularly regional banks is where rates currently are and the pressure here for the Fed to potentially cut rates. If the Fed doesn't cut rates or if it does, in fact, delay rate cuts, what does that mean for your business in the consolidation narrative? You know, I think the most important thing is not necessarily what happens with rates in the short term. It's the shape of the yield curve. Right. And we are now on, I think, 19 consecutive months. If you look at the uh, inversion of the yield curve between the twos and the tens, we need to see a steepening of the yield curve. It's not necessarily how many cuts or when those cuts happen, but what happens in the yield curve. A positively sloping yield curve is good for all banks. So that's what we look forward to getting back to. And in terms of what the market thinks is going to happen with rates, I think the market's getting ahead of the Fed. And we've heard that with the latest Fed speak. I think it, this year, if we get a couple of cuts, I think that will be a good thing. I don't think we're going to see the five or six cuts the market was thinking a month or so ago. For construction projects that are waiting for that pathway of cuts to really emerge, how does that pass through to some of the banks that then would be the loaners of, of those pro or on those projects um, and, and trying to figure out you know, where they play a role in financing some of those projects as well? It, the bottom line is it makes it tougher, yeah. right? Because with higher rates means it's a higher debt service. So the sponsor is going to have to come up with more cash. The, the lower the rate, the more proceeds the sponsor can get and the lower the debt service. So you have a lot of sponsors waiting on the side, waiting for the Fed to act so that they can put more of the money into the actual project itself and less into the financing costs. Brent Beardall, thanks so much for taking the time here today. We certainly do appreciate it. Appreciate it, Brett and Shauna. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone, we've got all your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Shares of Potbelly moving to the downside on the heels of its quarterly results, revenue surpassing the street's expectations, but adjusted EPS coming in weaker than expected for a deeper dive into the company's quarterly results. We're joined by Bob Wright, who is the CEO and president of Potbelly. Thanks so much for taking the time here. We were just talking about Potbelly in the break. I was going down memory lane. I used to visit you guys once a week. Uh, I'm sorry, clearly I need to do more here, so I'll do my part next quarter, promise you. But first and foremost, walk us through this quarter. What are some of the catalysts that are jumping out to you that the company can lean further into? And where are some of the weak spots that you feel like might need some course correcting? Yeah, thanks. It's good to be with you. Uh, it was a it was a great quarter for us. We had another quarter of same store sales growth uh, driven primarily by traffic growth. Second quarter in a row, we've been able to say that uh, we had strong profitability and and uh, beat our guidance both for the quarter and for the year. So I'm I'm thrilled with the performance of our team. Very very proud of the work that we've we've achieved and accomplished. Really not just in Q4 but throughout 2023. What's driving it? Uh, the the five pillar strategy that we've been operating under since 2021 uh, is really at the root of our efforts and it's the root of our success. Digital was a big uh, success for us in, in the fourth quarter. Over 40% of our business came through our digital channels. That's 150 basis points better than, than a year ago. And for the second quarter in a row, we're very excited about this. Uh, more than half of our digital business is coming through our own channels, um, our, our perks loyalty program, our app, our web. Uh, and that's what's really driving the business. Uh, we rolled out a new, uh, a, a new enhanced perks loyalty program in January. But even before we did that, one of the other numbers we shared was an 87% increase in our perks loyalty membership growth. Uh, in the quarter versus a year ago. So a very strong quarter for us. We're really pleased. Bob, when we talk about inflation, obviously it's had a real impact on you, on your uh, competitors out there. How have you navigated uh, your pricing strategy and what does that look like here as we're starting to see some of those pressures ease? Yeah, it's a great question. In fact, uh, part of that five pillar strategy was the rollout of our new menu back in 2021, and it became the foundation for reestablishing a much more value centric relationship with our customers. We introduced the third size. We brought down the entry point pricing on our skinny sandwiches. We enhanced the, the original and bakes with more meat and more cheese and made the sandwiches bigger and meatier and did that without raising the, the cost to the consumer by the same amount of investment we put in the food cost. So we intentionally took our food cost up as a translation of value for the customer. Since then, in the last three years of inflation, we've been very intentional with our pricing only to take enough pricing to offset the pressure on food and labor costs. There have been pressures elsewhere in our P&L, but we believe it's our, our responsibility to our customers to find efficiency in those other areas and not ask them to shoulder all of that burden. And we certainly haven't been taking price to drive margin like some other brands have done. Uh, last year, that meant uh, three price increases uh, in the low, low, low single digits individually. And, and uh, the net, ben net benefit to us was just barely offsetting that inflation. We expect similar uh, sort of inflationary pressure to carry through our business this year. And again, we'll see some very small price increases just to offset that. We watch average eater check um, as well as average check as a barometer for our value proposition for our customers. And we watch it not only compared to fast casual, mm -hmm. but compared to QSR and to casual dining as well. And uh, the data that we see suggests we're in a really good spot in terms of, of price per eater. Um, you put that on top of the great experience, Brad, that you talked about. I mean, these 500 degree toasted sandwiches, fresh baked cookies every day, soups that are made every day. And these are these are things that people evaluate as they look at their total experience. So uh, yeah, uh, we, we think it's important and we try to protect it. Yeah, those strawberry milkshakes are family, Bob. You know, at the end of the day, though, a lot of people might be asking themselves, why do bigger sandwiches make sense at a time where increasingly weight loss drugs, GLP-1s, Ozempic getting tossed around at a household level at this point and impacting yeah, appetites? We, we were, we weren't uh, creating a, a size a barrier for our customers by, by making those sandwiches bigger. We were right-sizing them to what their expectations were. And as I said, at the same time, we introduced a skinny sandwich, which was a smaller sandwich that we'd never had before. Um, and, uh, you know, I think naming it skinny was part of our way of, of being on brand. But frankly, it's, it's really hit the consumer in the way that they want. 
We have consumers that are customers that buy up and down through all three sizes, and a lot of it depends on what, what that meal occasion is for them that day. Skinny is also an option you can pair with a soup, you can pair that with a salad, and it's a, it's a great lower cal calorie meal for the customer that, that fits their needs. Um, those are available in every single flavor. So I, I think we're in a great spot in terms of variety, sizing, um, and caloric content for, for really all parts of the menu. All right, Bob, we got to leave it there. But Bob Wright, Pop Belly, CEO and President, thanks so much for joining us here at Yahoo Finance this morning. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. Let's do a quick check on the markets. 90 minutes into the trading day, you're still looking at gains across the board following the jobs report that we got out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time today. You've got the Dow up another 121 points, the Nasdaq up about 7 tenths of a percent. A lot of that being driven by the fact that the Federal Reserve rate cut still in play here in terms of what that timing could be around the middle of the year. Keep right here, Rochelle and Akiko. I've got you for the next hour. We'll see you on Monday. Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's what I'm watching this Friday. The U.S. economy adding more jobs than expected in February, while the unemployment rate rose for the first time in four months. We'll discuss what this means for the Fed's rate-cutting cycle ahead. 
And from new climate disclosure rules to the approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs, it's been a busy year for SEC Commissioner Gary Gensler. Gensler is going to weigh in here first on Yahoo Finance, our conversation with the SEC chair straight ahead. That's right. And Bitcoin is reaching record highs. Can the rally take other crypto related stocks to new heights as well? Robinhood CEO Vlad Tenev joins us later in the hour to discuss. First, though, let's take a look at where markets are trading right now. 90 minutes into the trading day on this Friday, and we are seeing green arrows across the board. The Dow up 96 points, the S&P 500 up 20, the Nasdaq up 95 points, the S&P 500 on track for another winning week. And the Nasdaq, by the way, hitting a new high in the session. All of this on the back of that jobs data we got this morning. 275,000 jobs added in the month of February with unemployment, as Rochelle mentioned, ticking a little higher to 3.9% there. And we are watching the Treasury market on the back of that. Let's take a look at where yields are. Uh, it is uh, down for five-year yield and the 10-year yield right now at 4.09%. The 30-year yield pushing higher at 4.27%. That's right. Well, as Akiko mentioned there, February's headline employment data blowing past expectations, adding 275,000 jobs versus the projected 200,000. But we're seeing some softening with unemployment ticking higher to 3.9% and, of course, downward revisions to job growth. But overall, the labor market does remain strong. To break down how this squares with, squares with investor optimism for a June interest rate cut, Veronica Willis, Wells Fargo Investment Institute strategy analyst, is here with more. Thank you for joining us this morning. And so, of course, we're looking at this big headline jobs number, but in the back of our minds, also keeping in mind the significant revisions that we saw in December and January, down 167,000 with that. Is this investor optimism still justified? Yeah, you know, I think what we saw this morning is a still solid job market, but then, as you mentioned, signs of some softness there that bears watching. So we've got some downward revisions, but it was revisions to numbers that were still pretty good for December and January. And then that tick up for that unemployment rate still leaves us at a pretty historically low unemployment rate. So we're not at numbers that are concerning yet, but it is a sign to watch going forward. And what we've seen in some of the recent consumer sentiment and consumer confidence surveys is that the consumer is starting to get a little concerned about the labor market. So it's something that they're watching closely. Veronica, we heard the president yesterday, <clears throat> the State of the Union, touting his economic policies, but talking specifically about where we are in the economy right now, saying the economy's landing is and will be soft. Is that what the state is pointing to? Yeah, I think we're seeing signs that the economy is softening, but that we're not going to kind of get into <clears throat> negative growth there. We're not expecting recessionary um Situ a recessionary situation, but we are expecting growth to soften from that really high growth that we saw in the third quarter of last year. We've started to see some softness already with that fourth quarter data that came out, and the trend is continuing for some economic softness. And so then as we look sort of digging within some of these earnings reports, which are also a good indicator of what's happening versus some of this backwards looking data here, what is that data telling us and how does that square with some of the projections that we're expecting for a June interest rate cut? Yeah, I think what's really interesting is that we've seen those those earnings for the large cap space in particular exceeding expectation as those larger companies have been able to kind of withstand all of these economic uncertainties a little bit better than what you've seen in the small cap space. And that's really translated into our guidance for favoring the large cap space over small cap while there are still some uncertainties underlying the market. Um, we haven't seen small caps really benefit from that same um, still strengthen the consumer that we've seen in the large cap space. And the biggest trade that's uh, most overlooked, you think, Veronica, right now? Yeah, I think right now the, the market isn't paying as close attention to some of those, um, some of that PMI data that's been coming out. We've seen some weakness with that manufacturing sentiment for over a year now. We st are starting to see the services sentiment declining and the market is shrugging it off a little bit because it's paying closer attention to that inflation data, paying closer attention to that labor market data. But that is something that bears watching when you're thinking about the, the economy starting to slow. That um, manufacturing sentiment has been slowing for over a year now and services is starting to follow. 
Veronica Willis, Wells Fargo Investment Institute Strategy Analyst. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, the SEC approved new requirements for public, public companies to disclose their climate risks on Wednesday. Joining us now with the latest on this move, our very own Jennifer Schomberger with a special guest. Jen. Thanks, Akiko. I'm, for more insight on that, I'm joined now by SEC Chair Gary Gensler here at SEC HQ. Chair Gensler, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. Great to be with you, Jennifer. This week, a milestone week for you. You finally approved those long-awaited climate risk disclosure rules. Why the decision, though, to remove the requirement for so-called scope three, those indirect emissions? Um, and here I thought you were going to talk about the execution quality rule we finalized this week. No. Um, we are a disclosure-based agency. And what we have found, and when I came into the job, that investors are making investment decisions based upon the disclosures of companies. Hundreds, if not over a thousand companies already are making information available to their investors about climate risk. So through a process called notice and comment rulemaking, we put out a proposal. We got 24,000 comments on it. And uh, we finalized that rule this week. Just as we've done for decades, it's grounded in this concept of materiality, that which is material to investors, a reasonable investor taking it into consideration for their investment decisions. You're asking about uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We required in this rule a requirement that companies, larger companies, disclose so-called scope one. This is their own emissions, so-called scope two, uh, the emissions about their energy purchases. You're now going to a separate topic as so-called scope three, the emissions of their suppliers and their customers. And as we had said at the proposal stage, um, this area wasn't as developed. Fewer companies right now, fewer issuers are making such information available. And we got a lot of comments that a lot of investors find it helpful to use this information, but we chose at this time not to have a requirement, a rule. Companies could still make the disclosures. They could put the information out. But we really focused on that which was material around scope one and scope two for the larger filers, as well as some really important disclosures around how companies are managing material climate risk. Democrats have said that the rule doesn't go far enough because of the elimination of scope three. Would you ever consider adding that in at some point in the future? Well, again, our, we're a securities regulator. We are not a climate regulator. And we are agnostic as an agency as to the merits of particular investments. That's how Congress laid out our authorities. Uh, in terms of developments in the market, we try to update our rules based upon developments in the market. So 14 years ago, my predecessor, who sat in this very office, Chair Shapiro, Mary Shapiro, uh, she and that commission put out guidance how the then existing rules would be applicable to disclosure of climate risk. 14 years later, we put in place the first actual rule for such disclosure. It, it will be for future commissions to consider uh, whether to make adjustments to this. Again, though, grounded in materiality, that which a reasonable investor finds important or significant for their investment decisions, buying and selling securities, voting, agnostic as to climate. Democrats don't think you've gone far enough. On the flip side, Nine Republican-led states now are mounting a lawsuit against this rule. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce reportedly considering litigation. Uh, so is the Sierra Club. So coming from multiple sides, do you think this rule can withstand court challenges? I feel very confident in the work of the staff and the work of the commission. Um, 
we really stayed within, if I can use a tennis analogy, our chalk lines. Mm -hmm. Congress lays out a certain approach, um, and that's what we're doing. I would also note, if I could, could how important it is to stay within one's chalk lines. That's when the confidence in our markets comes from a securities agency, SEC, that oversees $110 trillion capital markets and that we stay uh, focused on investors' needs, what investors, uh, how they're making their decisions and that they get what President Roosevelt said was uh, complete information, truthful information about those companies. That, that's what we, we did here. We've done this decade after decade. We've updated rules in the 1970s about environmental disclosures, um, risk factors, uh, ma management discussion and analysis. And each time we've updated it, there's been lots of debate. And there'll be some people that are disappointed across the spectrum. But of course there's debate. We've got 24,000 comments. You would imagine that there's differences of points of view. And do you think that over the next 10 years, I know you're not a climate regulator, but do you think over the next 10 years that climate change could pose the risk of safety and soundness for publicly traded companies um, broadly or perhaps more narrowly given the nature of a company's business? Uh, again, in, it's not, it doesn't matter what I think. It's investors. Investors have asked for and have needed this information in their investment decisions. And just in the 14 years since my predecessor, Chair Shapiro, had put out that guidance, things have evolved and changed. And literally 90% of the top 1,000 companies, the Russell 1000, were already putting some information out, 60% putting information with regard to greenhouse gas emissions. I think it's in that realm we, we have a role to play. And we're merit neutral mm -hmm. as to those investments that investors make. They can go long, you know, buy something or go short and sell something. Mm -hmm. That's up to them. We're agnostic. All right. Talking about a different C that you like, crypto. We're staying with the C's today. We're staying with the C's today. Uh, You're going to go to China too? We could if you want. There we go. Before that, though, it's been roughly, what, two months since you approved the spot Bitcoin ETF. Uh, now the industry is pushing to green light options for spot Bitcoin ETFs, or ETPs, I should say. Uh, I know the commission in the past has approved options for Bitcoin futures funds. What's your thinking on this? Um, for your viewers, I know Jennifer knows this, that uh, People in roles like mine try not to prejudge things that are in front of the commission. And we have an administrative process to consider such filings and the like. Um, and that's what we'll do uh, based on the law and based on the, the uh, filings in front of us. At least 10 firms have filed applications for spot ether ETPs. I'm wondering, do you see the grayscale court case that applied to spot Bitcoin ETPs as precedent setting uh, that could apply in general to crypto spot ETPs, or is there a different set of criteria depending on the underlying asset? Um, again, I don't want to prejudge any one uh, filing, and, and as you said, there's 10 filings in front of us, so news alert, uh, I'm not going to prejudge that. But to your question, we look at the facts and circumstances and that which was in front of us and we approved earlier in January were exchange traded products for Bitcoin and it was solely to Bitcoin, uh, a uh, important set of filings. I thought that it was the most uh, sustainable path forward uh, along with the commission to approve those. And investors, uh, got additional disclosures based upon those exchange traded products. Uh, they get certain protections on the stock exchanges, but they should also, I would say, be aware it's a highly speculative, volatile underlying asset, Bitcoin. To your point, does the ability to stake Ether 
change your perspective on whether an Ether ETP is a suitable product like a spot Bitcoin ETP? Uh, again, I'm not going to speak to the specifics of filings in front of us. I understand the question. In general, though, can you talk? Not, not about Look, a specific I think, file. I think there's 15 to 20,000 of these crypto tokens. And for many of them, the investing public is looking for a better future based upon the efforts of others. And why do I say that? Think about it. Most of them, Jennifer, you can find an entrepreneur, a CEO, and actually interview her and sit down with the, the, the business leaders of that. You can find a website. You can find the investing public oftentimes, depending upon the facts, are investing their hard-earned funds into a investment contract is what the law would call it when you're investing in, in, in something, anticipating a profit based on the efforts of a group. Um, and this is the law of the land. That's the Supreme Court lays that out. But do you view the issue, I know you're talking about speculation and you've been worried about fraud and manipulation as it relates to Bitcoin. Do you view that differently as it relates to Ether at all? I think the whole crypto field has challenges. Um, it, it's, a, it's a whole, the whole field is rife with, with abuses and fraud. Look at the series of bankruptcies in 22 and 23, when investors weren't getting the proper disclosures from the middle of the market, the intermediaries. And by the way, for the viewing public, this is not that decentralized. That's part of the uh, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto and the folklore of decentralization. But in the middle, there are intermediaries uh, that are pulling together your hard-earned assets, not maybe not Jennifer's, but the hard-earned assets, and pulling them together and not giving you the proper disclosures. And they're doing things that we would never allow the New York Stock Exchange to do. They're trading against you. They're, they're commingling your funds. They're maybe lending your funds out. They're operating as a, a clearinghouse, a broker, a dealer, an exchange. I think that puts the investing public at risk. All right, well, we'll have to leave the conversation there. We're out of time, but Chair Gitzer, thank you so much, as always, for your insight. So appreciate it. Thank you. I'm sorry we didn't get to that third C. Yeah, we'll have to talk about China next time. Next conversation. All right, thanks. Rochelle, I'll send it back to you in New York. All right, thank you so much. Our very own Jennifer Schoenberger there with SEC Chair Gary Gensler. All right, stay with us on Yahoo Finance. We have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned.
Bitcoin and stock bulls are charging. A new frenzy surrounding the world's largest cryptocurrency is pushing the price of Bitcoin to all-time highs. This is all things AI have powered stocks such as Nvidia and Microsoft to new heights. So are major investing exchanges cashing in on all this excitement? Vlad Tenev, Robinhood co-founder and CEO, joins me now. Vlad, always nice to get some time with you. I know you do a lot of these interviews, uh, especially a couple weeks after earnings. But I'm like, I have to connect with Vlad because your stock is rallying. The broader market is rallying. On your platform, what have you know, these record-setting markets done to that platform? And what are you seeing uh, among people? Typically, when the crypto markets see uh, a lot of excitement, we benefit from that. You know, we're one of the largest crypto platforms um, in in the US. Um, we've been growing market share and that's continued uh, through 2023. I think last time I was on your show, we were talking a little bit about that. But um, it's definitely not just crypto. Uh, we've We've seen increased levels of activity with the markets across all of our assets and products. So people have been uh, entering the equity markets, uh, options trading has been up through 2023 as well. Uh, equities market share went up about 14%. Options market share at Robinhood was closer to 20 at about 19%. So as we've been improving our products, we stand to benefit when there's heightened market interest have you seen the, the rally, AI stocks, crypto, whatever it is, is this pulling in the next generation of investors? I think you're, you're seeing a couple of things. Certainly there's heightened retail interest and you're seeing investment apps uh, getting, uh, getting more downloads. You can look at kind of the public app store rankings and there has been a resurgence in interest in investing. Certainly we've benefited from that. Um, but what's really interesting is um, it's not just uh, it's not just the markets and it's not just individual AI stocks in crypto. Um, you look at our retirement business, more and more people are interested in retirement as well. So we announced that we had 1.7 billion in assets under custody in retirement accounts at the end of last year. And recently, our CFO was at a conference. He said that number had close to double that over three billion just in a couple of months. So um, there's general interest in long-term investing as well, and we're excited to be serving that market. Are investors still looking at Robinhood as as a trading platform? Because I've been following a lot of the work that you and your team have done really over the past twelve months. A lot more innovation, twenty-four hour trading, a push into retirement products. Do you ultimately want to be that one-stop destination for, you know, that maybe perhaps replaces going down to your local bank branch and, and using it for whatever you want to use it for? There's three things that we're focused on right now. Number one, uh, we want to be number one in the active trader market. So active traders are very important for us. Uh, they care about very specific things like performance, pricing, user experience. And we're making lots of investments there, both in the user experience and in new product innovations that other competitors don't offer. 24 hour market being a great example there. But we don't want to just serve active traders. And so we wanna grow wallet share with our customers. We wanna help them build wealth. And that's the second priority. And that's where Robinhood Gold and our high yield products come in. That's where retirement comes in and of course, the credit card where we're entering a new product category that's very important to customers. Then the third area of focus is expanding internationally. I think the last time I was at your show, we were uh, we had just announced the UK launch and we had also launched in the EU. And we see a huge opportunity there, hundreds of millions of consumers that are underserved. And that's sort of our beachhead to the rest of the world. What is the size of that credit card business, uh, how big could that be 12 months after launch? And where exactly are you with that product? One of the reasons we're so interested in the credit card market is it's so big, right? Uh, over 80% of US adults have a credit card, at least one. Um, there's hundreds of millions of credit cards in circulation. Um, 
in the U.S. alone. And if you look at the credit card market in general, we see three things. Number one, it's large. Number two, the incumbents are enjoying very large margins. So the, the profit pools in that business are very large. And the third is it hasn't really been digitized yet. So the experience of a credit card, I mean, sans Apple Pay is pretty much the same as it was 20 years ago. Um, and when we see those three things, we see a great opportunity for us to enter the market and, and disrupt. So um, it's, it's getting close. The team's been working hard. I've seen the designs and we'll be, uh, we'll be looking forward to unveiling it shortly. Vlad, just before you came on, we had the um, opportunity to talk to uh, SEC Chair Gary Gensler. And, and towards the end of the conversation, they were talking a lot about crypto and the moves in crypto. Uh, the chair noting uh, that the sector is rife with uh, abuses and frauds. And uh, at some point, you know, maybe the investment public is putting their own investments at risk. I mean, bigger picture, I, what do you think about this move in crypto? And, and do you think investors truly understand what they're getting in the crypto space right now? Uh, I think if I had to look at this move, um, it, it's, you know, we, we see uh, a supply and demand imbalance starting with Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? So all of these new ETFs came into the market. They've been gathering assets. We're now able to more easily plug institutional interest, of which there is a lot, in, uh, in crypto. And they've been, they've been generating more demand. You also have the the Bitcoin having where there's less supply coming in, and I think the market anticipates that. I do think um, the crypto space is quite broad. It, it refers to a lot of things now, including, you know, just coins that a couple of software engineers overseas can launch on an exchange. And I think with that level of decentralization and sort of. Uh, uh, access are risks. But then you look on the other side of the spectrum and there's significant institutional interest in adding Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies into customers' portfolios. Uh, more and more large institutions and endowments are starting to look at it. Um, governments you've seen uh, start to look at it too, um, like El Salvador, for instance. But think we anticipate that might not be the end of that. Um, and, and so I think that's very much entered the, the mainstream as, a, as an asset that customers need and, and look, uh, look to add in their portfolios. Vlad, you've been uh, leading this company really through two, like a, a series of big moments for investors. Of course, a couple of years ago with the, the meme stock frenzy, but right now markets at all time highs, crypto all time highs. What lessons are you putting to play today, leadership, operationally, whatever it might be? Things that you learned a couple of years ago, what are you putting into play now? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, a couple of years ago felt like a different world. You know, it felt like we, we didn't really have to um, operate particularly well as a company to do well. In, in COVID times, the tide sort of lifted all boats. Now, uh, starting in 2022 with the increase in interest rates, you know, it sort of washed out a lot of uh, a lot of the excess in the markets and we've had to operate differently. So just emphasizing efficiency, performance, focusing on the things that are incredibly important, making sure that the team is aligned and, and we've got the top talent. I think these are all things that the management team and, and myself have learned over the past couple of years. And now when we see a little bit of a recovery and you know if, if interest rates then start dropping as many are predicting we should see that turn into a, a tailwind for the business in a in a big way uh, it's always uh, great to get a few minutes with you uh thank you always for making time for yahoo finance vlad ten of robinhood co-founder and ceo have a good weekend we'll talk to you soon thanks brian i appreciate it all right, coming up, investors are preparing for a likely Trump-Biden rematch in 2024. We'll break down the economic policies of both right after this break.
My heritage economy is on the brink. Now our economy is literally the envy of the world. 15 million new jobs in just three years, a record, a record. <laughs> Unemployment at 50-year lows. A record 16 million Americans are starting small businesses, and each one is a literal act of hope. Well, that was President Joe Biden Thursday touting his economic achievements during the State of the Union address. The president hinted at key policies he planned to unveil under a second term, but new polls show Biden trailing behind former President Donald Trump in a head-to-head -head matchup that divides even bigger on the issue of the economy. Let's bring in Henrietta Trey's Veda Partners, Director of Economic Policy and Managing Partner. Uh, Henrietta, it's good to talk to you today. Uh, there was a, a long list of policies the president unveiled during the State of the Union, whether it was on raising corporate taxes, bringing down drug pricing, limiting um, cap, uh, executive compensation. You know, how much of that you think landed with those voters out there who are still undecided, although I get the sense it's a very small portion of the electorate right now. Right. The undecided basket is the name of the game. You know, Republicans are going to vote for Trump and Democrats are going to vote for Biden. They're both both very popular with their bases. It's the 10 to 20 percent of the undecided basket, the Haley voters, the ones who are voting other in the run up to the primary that all eyes are on right now. And the message that the Biden administration is trying to get out last night and that they struggle with because uh, I think mostly home goods and housing and gas prices have been disproportionately high and there's sort of a COVID hangover. But I think the numbers that the White House wants to get out are all the ones in the threes right now. 3.4% GDP growth, 3.9% unemployment, 3.1% inflation. Anything with a three, the White House should be touting from the rooftops. And that's what Biden tried to do last night, getting the message across has been very difficult. You can see it in the polling data. There's just this tremendous basket, mostly of women across the United States, Democrats, independents, and Republicans, who have a disproportionately negative view of the state of the economy that's usually about 10 points higher than the way that men think of the economy. So reaching that voter, I think, is what the Biden administration tried to do last night. Obviously, that'll have a huge impact on things like that home buyer tax credit they touted, um, the difference between providing another $2 trillion in tax cuts for the 37% tax bracket and for the uh, corporate tax rate, which the Trump administration or the campaign would like to bring down further. Um, we speak with Republican staff all the time and they say, we didn't get points for that. We want to move on. Henry, the other thing we heard the president say yesterday is, is try to draw the arc between where the economy was pre-pandemic and where the economy is today, essentially reminding Americans that he came into office at the height of the pandemic, that there have been challenges over the last three years that have been unprecedented. Is that a message that you think is sticking with voters? I don't think it's landed yet. No, I think they've got a lot of work to do. Um, I, I think that if you followed the data back in November through now, the consumer confidence and executive confidence has risen, but that's not translating into the poll. That was a big concern for me and a part of the reason I downgraded my odds of a Biden administration in 2025 is because that economic message is just not landing, despite the fact that the data is there. So you really have a disconnect that the campaign can, in theory, seize on and make gains with. Um, we'll see if, tomorrow, if last night's speech moved the needle. Based off of early exit data from CNN and from some dial polls in Arizona, it looked like 63 to 74 percent of people who were watching this speech last night had a very favorable view of Biden by the end. That's uh, pretty unheard of in politics. You don't see numbers in the 60s and 70s on anything. You know, you could say that water is wet and you'd find more of the population that would disagree with you than that. So I think the speech did have the potential to move the needle. We're just going to wait for polling data to see if it did actually. And we should get that meant by, you know, Monday or Tuesday. So Henrietta, obviously President Biden had the chance here to, to put some numbers behind his achievements here and lay out an economic plan. And some of still the unfinished um, plans that he wants to see, including more clean energy jobs. Are we at a point yet where we can clearly stack up President Biden's economic plan and how he plans on paying for it with former President Trump's? As some of it is still, at this point, reactionary that we're getting from um, former President Trump's side. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, that is what I do for a living, of course. Um, so I speak with Senate Republican staff 
on the finance committees, on the House Ways and Means committees, and I speak with their Democratic counterparts. As you know, uh, the president gets to talk about what he wants to do, but the only people that can actually enact legislation on tax policy are Congress. So in a report that I put out yesterday, I walked through the $2.7 trillion worth of programs. I'm sorry, the $6 trillion worth of programs that the Trump administration in 2025 would potentially like to enact which yields about $2.5 trillion in deficit increases versus about $4.5 trillion worth of spending that the Biden administration would like to see. And the um, commensurate, I think it's $1.6 trillion in deficit increases in the charts that I have. So um, obviously, if anybody wants to reach out and talk about those, we can. A big difference is whether or not the SALT deduction comes back. Um, speaking with Democratic staff, it appears very likely that they will allow that to expire entirely. That's the state and local tax deduction. It's a disproportionate benefit for those in high property tax states. And the alternative would be um, the Trump tax plan, which would extend the 39.6% the marginal tax rate on high income earners would be uh, remaining at 37%. So really, it's a would you rather kind of um, approach to what we're going to see in 2025. And I think, uh, you know, if you're paying attention closely, you can walk through exactly how they're going to pay for their legislation and how they are going to spend whatever money they do raise. The biggest difference is probably tariffs. Um, the Trump administration has in their mind that they will be able to pay for about two and a half trillion dollars worth of tax cuts with tariffs. Now, um, the JCT will not score a tariff as revenue for offsetting the cost of this bill, so it will be deficit increasing. That's a little bit wonky, but it's an important nuance when it comes to figuring out, well, how much of these tax breaks can they really actually extend without blowing through the deficit in a way that loses you Republican votes on the Hill? Either way, you're going to be looking at some pretty partisan legislation. Um, it's a matter of where you'd like to see that money spent. Do you think um, the corporate tax rate cuts and the tax cuts be extended uh, in their entirety is your desire, mm. then you want Trump. If you want a different outcome, um, something like SALT, something like um, increased homebuyer tax credits, expanded child tax credits, you want to vote for Biden. We'll certainly see if people vote with their with their tax brackets or whether they're looking sort of longer term. But interesting to see that stacked up side by side. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Henrietta Trace, Veda Partner, Director of Economic Policy and Managing Partner. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Well, TikTok fighting back against Washington's latest missive, a bipartisan panel of lawmakers voting unanimously Thursday to pass legislation forcing ByteDance to divest ownership of TikTok within 165 days. The bill now goes before the full House. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley to give us the details. And obviously this is bipartisan, something that we know has been in the works. But here we are now with this bill passed going through. Yeah, members of the Energy and Commerce Committee voted 50-0 to advance this uh, legislation, basically uh, calling for more or less a ban on TikTok, but it's not exactly a ban. Essentially, uh, if the legislation ended up getting passed, uh, ByteDance would have 165 days to divest itself of TikTok so that it would be a full separation of the U.S. operations uh, and its China-based parent company. Uh, if they don't do that, then uh, Google, Apple, uh, they wouldn't be able to host uh, anything to do with TikTok after that point. So it's more or less a, a ban on the app. Now, uh, because TikTok uh, saw this, obviously, as did everyone else, what they did was they started putting notifications when you open the app, telling users to reach out to their local representative uh, and tell them they don't want to use the app. Uh, according to some representatives, uh, it was just basically the only way to get into the app was to make a phone call. So some of them were getting calls and then hangups. Uh, but this is clearly TikTok's way of saying, you know, look, we're not going to take this laying down. Uh, they say that they don't have access to Americans' user data, uh, or sorry, they say that ByteDance doesn't have access to Americans' user data, that China, uh, the Chinese government doesn't have access to Americans' user data. Uh, but there have been some reports where there's been mention of uh, workers in China at ByteDance having some access to US user data. And really the, the fear here from uh, the uh, politician side is that if the Chinese government gets access to Americans' user data, they may be able to manipulate that in some way or uh, get Americans to agree with a point of view that uh, helps uh, the, the Chinese government. Uh, they say that this is an example of it by getting people to call their representatives. Um, you know, you can argue that it's just being part of a civic-minded society, but uh, there's the fear that this is the kind of mobilization that they they don't uh, want China to be able to 
do with regards to TikTok. So we're going to have to see if this actually goes and passes the House, and then uh, a version would have to go through the Senate as well. Uh, but President Biden is behind this, uh, and it, it appears as though uh, there's there's a lot of support if it's going 50 nothing uh, in this committee. Yeah, lawmakers uh, reportedly getting flooded with those calls from TikTok users. Always the fear, right, Dan? You don't want to upset some of those users, but we'll see where this goes. It has been an ongoing issue. Dan Halley, thanks so much. Well, coming up, California's minimum wage is rising for fast food chains. What it means for consumers and for the companies on the other side. We'll break it down. Well, new jobs data this morning pointing to continued gains in hourly wages that increased 4.3 percent year on year in the month of February. Wages for fast food workers are about to go even higher in California thanks to a new law raising minimum wage to $20 per hour next month. Our next guest says that could pave the way for other states to follow. Let's bring in Michael Reich. He's University of California, Berkeley professor of economics. We've also got our very own Brooke De Palma joining in on the conversation. Um, professor, it's good to talk to you today. You know, the thinking is always that when you've got wages that push higher, that isn't necessarily good news for businesses. How are you assessing the impact to businesses, whether they are franchises or company owned? Yeah, yeah, it, it's probably going to affect the franchises and the company owned stores about the same because the wages are about the same and the share of labor costs are about the same in both. The the uh, increase seems like it's really big. It is big. It's uh, an increase from the state minimum wage, which is now $16 up to $20. That's a 25% increase. And it affects about 600,000 fast food workers and there are probably about 37,000 uh, fast food stores in California. So those are, are pretty big numbers. The the actual increase in the wage, though, not the nominal increase in the mandated minimum, that's 25%, the actual increase is going to be a lot smaller. It's going to be more like 5%. And, and that's be, partly because about a third of the state already lives in areas like uh, Los Angeles or San Francisco that have their own higher than state minimum wage. And it's partly because many uh, restaurants already offer wages that are above $16. So based on past experience with these minimum wage increases, we think it'll go up about 5%. And that's um, that doesn't sound as quite as scary. Uh, moreover, 
uh, labor costs are only about a third of operating costs in fast food. So the actual labor, uh, the operating cost increase is one third of the 5%, which is, uh, which is what, about 1.7%. So that amounts to, uh, for a $5 Big Mac, that would be eight cents. That's not going to deter most consumers. I, I think this restaurants will be able to weather this uh, quite well, given uh, these actual facts, as opposed to, you know, the fear, oh, minimum wage yeah. increase of 25%. And Michael, when you think about the pricing power that these companies have here, higher yeah. menu prices seem to be the go-to answer. Will that be enough to offset and will demand still be there for these smaller, right. higher right. prices? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, fast food prices have increased about 20% in the last few years, but not because of minimum wage increases. They've gone up that much in in states that are still at 725 minimum wages. So, uh so there's clearly other things that affect prices. If you just try to isolate the effect of, of minimum of the, this minimum wage, as I said, it's it's going to be about a uh, less than two percent of uh, of the existing price level. And the uh, Department of Agriculture has done some very good studies in their Economic Research Service showing that uh, pri prices increases of that magnitude don't affect demand very much. Uh, hardly at all, mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, in fact, so, probably the, the price increase will be greater than any decline in demand, and that'll uh, actually leave the store owners uh, better off because they'll have more revenue. So, Michael, two questions on that. You know, number one, if this goes beyond California, that's the big question. How inflationary is that likely to be? But also, number two, as businesses try to adjust costs here, does that mean this will push more to automation? Okay, well, first of all, this is a one time increase. It's not going to affect inflation, you know, a year or two uh, from now. It's probably all going to be. Uh, the price effect will probably work its way through within three to six months. Um, yeah, this policy could spread in other areas. Uh, we have a, a very heterogeneous terrain across the states, what the minimum wages are. The, the minimum wage is already $20, a few pennies shy of $20 in Seattle and close to that in Denver. But then there are all about 20 states where it's still $7.25. Uh, will, will this uh, be copied in other states? It, I think we have to see how the experiment works, but it's possible. It's just like uh, the minimum wages that increased first in California have, have spread in, in other states. Uh, on your other question yeah, about- We have seen that. Um, yeah. Uh, that, Michael, that, I, I apologize. Unfortunately, we're going to have to go. We're unfortunately out of time here, but um, really appreciate you joining us today. We'll have to pick up the conversation again. Michael Reich, University of California, Berkeley professor of economics. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Well, coming up, how higher for longer rates could make or break some investors' retirement plans. That after the short break.
We got a lot of Fed speak this week, pointing to interest rates staying restrictive for longer than investors hoped. But with rate cuts expected later this year, how could those impact those near retirement? We have our very own Kerry Hannon with us on this. Good to see you, Kerry. So what should people keep in mind as they're getting ready to recalibrate into retirement? Absolutely. Uh, great question, Rochelle. Here's the great news is this is actually super uh, news for people who are near retirement in the sense that, you know, if the opportunity to lock in at some of these higher rates on things like CDs and money markets and treasuries, this is an opportunity to really give yourself that buffer for those early years in retirement in particular, to where you might need that cash for your living expenses. And I think we've all seen, you know, a pretty sweet run up in the equity portion of our retirement portfolios in the last year. So this is a wonderful time to take a good look um, and just maybe lop off some of those equity uh, um, appreciation there and put that over into some of these safer, more secure things. Treasuries in particular are wonderful because, you know, you can buy those direct, directly at Treasury Direct and they are free from, in general, local and state taxes. So that's another good opportunity. But they're all, you know, bumping over 5%. So take a look at these. But no one is saying to get out of equities altogether because, my goodness, if you've got a couple of decades uh, ahead of you in retirement, you need that equity portion of your portfolio to continue to grow. So what this is really about, it's about rebalancing, like you said, recalibrating. So I think it's just a great time and people really need to jump on this. The decision to retire is a whole different ball of wax about whether you actually have enough saved to support the lifestyle you want. But for, for near retirees, this is a super opportunity to get in at some of these low, these high rates with low risk. Can certainly lock in some goodies there and perhaps take take a little some of those equity profits, put it into something a little bit little less risky, at least at this point. I appreciate you as always. Kerry Hannon, thanks so much. Thank you. Well, that's it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufo alongside Akiko Fujita. Thanks for watching Yahoo Finance and have a great weekend.